welcome. It is my great pleasure to welcome everyone uh, to back Basis for Aktuelle Kunst in Utrecht, albeit virtually, on this occasion of the opening of Fragments of Repair, a multi-part project convened by Bach with artist Kader Atia and the Colonial Forum La Colonie in Paris. My name is Maria Halavajova. I'm uh, artistic director of Bach, a base, a base for art, knowledge and social action, a base for working from within the conditions of the world, with, through and in art, and driven by the urgencies that shape this very world uh, at present, as well as by the principles of social culture and ecological justice. I would like to take this opportunity to share with you a few opening words on behalf of the Bach team. Now, although we are streaming live from the Bach venue, it does not re uh, need reminding that we here in the Netherlands and across most of the planet continue negotiating the one and a half meter or six foot social distance societies, lockdowns and curfews across multiple and even larger urgencies of social, ecological and cultural injustices that this robust inaugural event of the age of pandemics made even more evident. And thus taking place a year and a half into the COVID-19 pandemic, the project Fragments of Repair emerges into a world in a more visible state of brokenness. An avid multiplier of not just itself, but every injustice in it encounters. The virus and its effects continue to reveal deep-seated wounds and injuries across the globe in need of repair. Brought into full view, it becomes obvious that these wounds and in, uh, injuries issue from the nexuses of historical colonialisms and present-day authoritarianisms, economic disparities and growing racial violence, and the continuous abuses inflicted upon already vulnerable, precarious lives and increasingly fre frequent climate disasters. These underlying historical, social, political and economic conditions amplified under pandemic emergency by social isolation, sustained stress, chronic uncertainty, existential insecurity, emotional despair, exhaustion, loss and fear, have expanded the viral contagion into a disquieting global psychological pandemonium. This is the urgency that shaped this project, even if, even if or perhaps in spite of the fact that we cannot gather in physical proximity, so as to engage in an ongoing collective, multi-directional and propositional conversation around the following question. What pathways can repair? Not a return to past ways, but an itinerary shaped by demands for decolonization and the politics of restitution. What pathways can repair offer to life in and out of the viral and psychological pandemonium? Now, driven by this question and the urgency of the wounded psyche and the injured collective mental health, the project puts forth the notion of decolonial repair, conceptualized by artist Kader Atia as both a tool and a tactic of engagement with the current conjuncture. To be sure, injury, wound and repair have been key concepts across Kader's artistic practice particularly in relation to the material and immaterial injustices of colonial violence that persist into the present. Repair, according to the artist, is, and I quote, a form of culture resistance by means of reappropriation. Kader often cites the Japanese art of ceramics mending, kintsugi, or the practices of pre-colonial African societies, while the former showed broken ceramic pottery fragments resealed in radiant gold to highlight both their breakage and repair, the latter engaged in a boundless chain of reparation upon reparation, acknowledging the object's journeys and making the traces of their memory fully evident. In this view, repair is always necessarily bound to wound and injury in a fundamental, permanent way. Even if the mind, especially in Western societies, faring under the modern flag of reason, wants to have its psychological and physical scars removed, erased or hidden at the very least. Against such denial, Kader proposes to reclaim the scars, keep them in sight and thus acknowledge that in every repair there is something irreparable. 
In other words, that every repair is necessarily partial, fragmented, and fragmentary. This fragmentation, this irreparability, then is both the reservoir for ways of knowing the world as well as a source for future-oriented resistance and resilience. Repair there is not a return to what was uh, or the oft-repeated desire of return to normality, but a space for collective performative imagination aimed at carving alternative ways toward what is yet to be. Today we at BAGA are excited to inaugurate three main fragments of Fragments of Repair. The exhibition here at BAC, um, a collective study program at uh, La Colonie in Paris, and the off and online series of gatherings with lectures, conversations, screenings and assembly forums, forums of which this session is the first one. Now the exhibition Fragments of Repair, Kader Atia, is conceived as a multivocal repository of knowledges and practices of decolonial repair. Across nine works, it engages with questions of the legacy of colonialism, the conundrum around the restitution of colonial objects, the structure violence of present day racial and extractivist capitalism, and the practices of state-sponsored control and surveillance of the vulnerable and disenfranchised, and of course, the role of modern architecture in these. Now, if the works begin from the robust critique of the past and present ills, they also tirelessly engage with speculative visions of repair in relation to the collective psyche and alternative imaginaries as propositions of other non-hegemonic futures. Now, even if the exhibition is uh, installed here around me, um, our public opening date is yet to be determined, of course, in sync to be sure with the regulations around public events here in the Netherlands. But in order to open it prospectively, if you will, and in a fittingly hybrid fashion throughout the program today, we uh, will venture into some of its installations. This is not in hopes of showing or representing the works, that's of course not possible, or substituting what may come from a close-up engagement with them, but to rather acknowledge these works as reservoirs of knowledges of repair, from uh, which this entire project began its journey. We would like to see, could we, throughout the gathering today, engage the artworks and the exhibition in this, our assembly, and speak and think with and within them. For in-depth in depth engagement, however, uh, while waiting for the possibility of the public opening, some of you might be interested to get in touch um, about the possibility to engage with the exhibition in a focused and slower paced manner, as from next week, a week onwards, we offer single day one person residencies, so as to probe into the practices of reparative viewing and uh, shifting economics of attention within the more than human cosmopolitan uh, cosmopolitics with the works of art. Please do let us know um, if you are interested. Now, thinking of the works of art um, in the exhibition as repositories of knowledge, as I mentioned a couple of times, uh, one could say that prefigurative, speculative, or anticipatory learning, as we refer to it as a bug, a collective learning about what is, I what is yet to be, um, is embedded throughout the entire project. And indeed, this concept arises again in two accompanying fragments, fragments of repair, La Colonie Nomade, and fragments of repair, gatherings. Now, fragments of repair, La Colonie Nomade, is a collective study program conceptualized by political theorist, feminist, and decolonial activist, Françoise Verger. It expands on the notion of decolonial repair, drawing on decolonial strategies um, as a means of meaningful survival and collective acts of repair, perhaps in spite of the cruel capitalist economy of exhaustion. It also marks the continuation of La Colonie in a nomadic form. For as many of you know, La Colonie, co-founded by Kader in 2016, was an independent space for the colonial thinking, debate, and culture activism located in Paris's Gare du Nord area. In summer 2020, however, the lockdown measures left La Colonie with no option but to close its doors. 
in the framework of this project, La Colonie assumes a nomadic existence, seeking ways to continue to generate excuse me, decolonized modes of being together with La Colonie, which La Colonie set in motion. Fragments of repair, La Colonie Nomad begins today now, as a matter of fact. And I'm particularly excited that we will join you in Paris in just an hour or so for a lecture by Françoise Verger when we switch the live stream from Bach to La Dynamo de Banlieue Bleu Pantin in Paris, um, who so generously hosts La Colonie Nomade for the duration of the study program. The third part of the project, Fragments of Repair, Gatherings, involves hybrid of and online conversations, lectures, screenings, and public assembly forums uh, around the theory and practice of repair. Conceptualized by Witzke Maas and convened by Bach around the theory and practice of repair, these gatherings um, are taking place in a bi-weekly rhythm, more or less, between today, which is a gathering one, as I mentioned, and beginning of August. And I really, truly look forward that you join us in these as well. And then acknowledgements. Fragments of Repair has been conceptualized uh, by Kader Atia and Witzke Maas in conversation with Françoise Verger. Thank you, Françoise. Myself and the Buck team. I would like to wholeheartedly thank everybody. I just mentioned mention thank you, Kader, Witzke and Françoise uh, for this all. To be sure, this project has been realized, or better yet, is being realized in a broad, extensive collective effort. And as everything goes well, technically, you can see on your screen that it has been carried out by so many, so many people. And my thanks go to all my colleagues at BAC, who once again went beyond and above the call of duty. Please know I'm humbled by your untiring commitment to not merely the projects we organize together, but in fact, to collectively tackling the urgencies that shape our collective lives at present. Thank you. And if it is difficult to highlight any individuals from within the BAC team, I nonetheless want to thank in particular Thomas Orbon, who took care of the production. Hide van Groningen, head of, head of public uh, practice, Nina Spa, intern and in fact the research assistant of the project, Joanneke van der Mole, who's uh, taking care of secondary school education within the w in the context of this project, and Rachel Rakes, uh, back curator pu for public practice, uh, for her knowledge, his advice, and uh, over overwhelming generosity. Thank you all. And of course, the tech and digital facilitation team um, uh, here, Irene kalabuch miron Hide van Groningen, Ruben Hameling, Tim van den Hof, Olga Leonard, Daniel Lodeweges, Witzke Maas, Thomas Orbon, Jun Saturai, and Nina Spa. I would also like to thank La Colonie in Paris, and in particular, uh, Alex uh, Hugonier, uh, Studio Kader Atia in Berlin, and in particular, uh, Kamara Sassi for her contribution to, to the production uh, of this project, working, uh, having been working really closely with the Buck team and of course the team of La Dynamo, and in particular uh, the director Xavier Lemaitre. I also, of course, would like to thank uh, many individuals and uh, groups and institutions who have engaged in enduring conversation uh, with us and collaboration across the project's planning and its making up to today, as well as in the weeks and months to come. Um, I would like to add one particular acknowledgement that seems important to add in these times to the spouses, partners and households of all colleagues involved in the project who have shared domestic labour and social reproductive work in these pandemic times when home office and homeschooling and home daycare etc. merged. I'd like to acknowledge all such interdependencies the off-screen labor, if you will, that allows the on-screen work as well as our gathering today uh, to take place. And last but not least, uh, the activities of BAC are made possible with the financial support of the Dutch Ministry of Education, Culture and Science and the City Council Utrecht. Fragments of Repair is part of the long-term BAC research itinerary, Propositions for Non-Fascist Living. 
and has received additional funding from VSB Fonds in Utrecht, Bank Giro Loterij Fonds Amsterdam, BNG Cultuur Fonds in The Hague, Fonds 21 in Utrecht, Prins, Bern Prins Bernard Cultuur Fonds Utrecht, Instituut Français de Peba, The Hague, and Instituut für Auslandsbeziehungen uh, in Stuttgart. And uh, at last, a couple of housekeeping notes. We'll need to adhere to time. La Colonie Nomade participants are gathered in Paris under curfew, and so we need to finish at no later than 18 hours. Um, that's also w why we will not be taking questions after each individual, uh, individual lecture, but we will have a chance to gather questions through the Q&A function in the Zoom webinar or for those tuning in uh, via Facebook at Facebook comments uh, sections. This will take place uh, during the closing conversation moderated by Sven Lutherken. And please note that the program is being recorded and will be available on the back website in the next couple of weeks. And now, at this point, we will switch to include Kader Atia and Witzke Maas, whom I will be joining for our conversation. After this extensive introduction, uh, uh, Kader, Kader Atia hardly requires an introduction, I believe, but for those who may have just joined us, a brief summary of at least some of his most recent projects, which include Kader Atia remembering the future in Kunsthaus Zurich in 2020, um, which also commissioned the work Objects Interlacing, which we see on the on show here. Other projects include the Museum of Emotion, the Hayward Gallery in London, uh, in 2019, uh, uh, mentioned Kader founded La Colonie in Paris, Paris's Gardenor area, as an open space for decolonial thinking, debate, and culture activism. Kader has also been appointed uh, uh, as a curator for the 12th Berlin Biennial, which will take place in 2022. And then my dear colleague Witzke Maas, um, who's been complicit uh, in conceptualizing together with Kader uh, and La Colonie and of course the entire BAC team, uh, the project Fragments of Repair. She's been involved with multiple BAC projects over the years in a curatorial capacity and as researcher and managing editor of Buck publications. So let me turn this over to you, Witzke. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, so perhaps to begin where the first conversations for this project started, uh, it was November 2019 when we had first flagged the idea to convene a project together with, um, between yourself, Carter, and Buck, and potentially also connecting to La Colonie. But it was really February 2020 when we first started to put our heads together uh, as to what this undoubtedly multifaceted project could entail. And February 2020 was, as we all know in our collective memory, the, um, the beginning of our entry into an age of pandemics. Um, and we were then on the brink of a prolonged period of confinement and reckoning with a world that can not go on as before. And so what we'd like to do in this conversation between Kada Marie and myself is to think back through some of the many conversations we have been having since then um, and in illuminating some of the conceptual threads that have become what Fragments of Repair is unfolding to be. And one of these threads is the notion of time, um, temporality, um, and perhaps repair as a slow emergence in time. We're told that this crisis is unprecedented, as though the pandemic is something that comes out of the blue. Um, but this crisis, like any crisis, is a temporal phenomenon. Uh, it's come out of a set of historical, economic, political processes. 
And I think the problem in response to the crisis is that there is a privileging of short-term computational emergency thinking. And while there is an immediate usefulness to this emergency thinking to deal with such a public health crisis, um, there's a lot of difficult conceptual um, conceptual work that needs to be done to understand what is happening. So paradoxically, in a time of crisis, when we don't have time to really think, it's actually the slow process um, and the painstaking process of deep reflection, which is what we really need to be able to do to begin to, begin to make sense of this planetary predicament um, and how to be able to change things long term. And so likewise, the process of repair that Kata, you've been grappling with in your artistic practice um, for some, what, 10, 12 years now, is not about finding short-term technical solutions, but about reparation as a slow temporality. And it became very obvious early on in our conversations that there is a clear continuum between how you've been working on repair on colonial trauma and how this trauma and the urging of its reparation over a long period of time is brought to a newfound intensity through the pandemic. Um, maybe to return to the temporality question in a bit, but first we can perhaps touch on the title of this project, um, Fragments of Repair, which suggests that repair is incomplete, a repair that doesn't have the pretense of making something whole again. Um, a repair can only ever be partial, a fragment, and that's in, the, in a way, I think, the contradiction of repair that you're working with. Um, and Kada, would you say that this contradiction that repair can only ever be a fragment is in essence a decolonial approach to repair? Thank you, Vizka. Thank you also, Maria, for this very nice introduction. I also join myself to all these acknowledgements regarding all the people who have been working on this project and also all the people who have been inspiring me in the last years and those who are listening to us today. I would say that uh, you really like raised two particular aspects of the repair that I care a lot, which is on the one hand this almost metaphysical way of the repair, how does it uh, work temporally what kind of temporality we can actually uh, affect to the Reaper. And uh, on the other hand, I would say the contrary, something which would be almost literal, the, the, the colonial trauma, something that is clearly political, clearly historical. And then uh, I have to say that I care a lot about this bridge because most of the time, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, in my own practices, I'm trying to go back and forth between very abstract and concrete things. Uh, I don't know, it, I, I've always been like this. Maybe that's why I'm like both also activist and artist. I think there's a moment where uh, the dream has to become a thought, a thing. I mean, yeah, the power of dreaming is uh, for me and for many philosophers, uh, the origin of any thinking, any thought. Like Stigler, Van Stigler used to say this a lot. I, I really think that uh, before to understand then the, the Reaper has a political claim, we need to understand how metaphysically it works. And uh, and what, what can be closer to metaphysics than poetry? So, and then, and then, and then the question of time, uh, is crucial here because uh, anything we do, anything we think, uh, any consciousness is linked to a time relation. I mean, it has been explained by Bergson very well, but also it's very easy to, to understand that when you are watching a film, when you are listening a poem or a song, uh, the, the relation your consciousness has with this artwork is a time relation. and. Uh, but time is not a continuity, is not an endless sort of thread without uh, fault. I mean, time is full of cracks, of differences, of uh, breakdown, of uh, injuries, I would say, 
I like to quote this quote that I found was uh, once by, I think it was Schubert, the composer, I'm not very fan of his music, but I found the quote quite amazing. It was saying that in the end, uh, music is an accumulation of injuries or the silence. So th this notion of, for me, uh, repair is, is as to be, and I, probably also because I'm an artist, I really started to think about the Reaper without thinking about it. I mean, it came to me in a very sensitive way by observing, basically, the, the first researchers uh, were uh, observing my, my environment, and then at some point collecting forms of Reaper. So here we, here we go about the fragments. I mean, the Reaper is not a, not a constant, handless flux. It's an accumulation of handless reparations and then handless injuries, because of course, we will see this later if you want, but I really constantly bind the injury and the repair all together. So, um, and from this uh, very, let's say, again, poetical, abstract uh, appreciation of the repair, uh, particularly because, again, it became clear in my mind that uh, what defined the Reaper is actually the injury. And then the, the real stake, when you need to take care of a Reaper, when, you, when you're willing to repair something, is how to deal with the injury. I mean, uh, uh, at any, any point in a very concrete way or abstract. Um, for me, the, the, here the bridge to my very personal history was very, uh, I mean, narrow. I mean, I really lived with, I mean, grown up in a family where the injury of colonialism were spoken from every day. I mean, I lost uh, two uncles and one grand-uncle because of the war killed by military, blah, blah, blah. So the injury is this trauma, and these are physical trauma. Then I'm not even talking about the humiliation and the handless everyday I mean, processes of uh, yeah, humiliation that has uh, I mean, really shaped the whole narrative of so many families in the, in the, in the, in the, as, as micro stories. So there was definitely a continuation that I found in my own practice as a, uh, uh, yeah, a, a tool to probably work on that you know, from this poetical approach, from this very artist approach that any artist is doing, I think, when he's producing an artwork, I, I really extract something that was, um, for me, important to elaborate in a political way to share. You touched on already um, the immaterial injuries and a crucial part of your work has been um, the question of psychic injury um, and psychic reparation. And of course, in this context of the, the pandemic year, we've witnessed the mental health pandemic, um, which has emerged alongside the viral one. So mass home confinement, but um, job layoffs, economic insecurity, um, ongoing uh, uncertainty and isolation has shown how both a viral pandemic and a pandemic of psychological distress are two sides of the same mirror. And we're not necessarily talking here about uh, extreme mental conditions such as psychosis, but the more common mental disorders such as depression, etc., cetera, um, which have increased exponentially this year. Um, so I'd like to um, ask you about your work on the psyche, which is something we decided to address explicitly for this project, and how a decolonial repair is also a means toward a reparation of psychic scars. Um, and looking back over my many notes of our conversations, you've, you've often at times referred to um, the decolonizing of the psyche. Um, we've actually never had really a, a, probably a chance to unpack this, and I was wondering if you could touch on this now. You mean on, um, what, what do you mean by decolonizing the psyche? Uh, that's, this is what I would be curious to, to hear from you because you have referenced it on one or two occasions. Okay. Um, and I was, I was just hoping you could elaborate on that. 
I mean, uh, first of all, uh, we need to go back to also a work I did a couple of years ago called Reasons Oxymoron. I think uh, I've always been very... Um, again, I'm not going to talk about uh, my own history, but here again, there's a family story that happens when I was a kid and my sister was sick. And then uh, on the one hand in France, they wanted to bring her in the, the hospital. And my mother brought her to my grandmother, who was a traditional healer, and she healed her. She was epileptic. I've always been fascinated by parallel, uh, I mean, medicine and traditional healings, from particularly from the culture where I come from, because it's an arena that I know, and uh, and all my education in ra very rational French philosophy, you know, and um, and when I and then later on by the, prax the praxis of uh, healings in, uh, in within modern uh, uh, coloniality. Uh, particularly of healing mental illnesses. And I have discovered, particularly when I was, I was interviewing a uh, Senegalese uh, psycho uh, psychiatrist, or Momar Gay, who, is, uh, who lives in Dakar, uh, on the way that um, when the white male arrived in Africa, those white doctors, psych psych psychiatrists, they were, I'm quoting Momar Gay, they, they were really thinking that the, the, the people uh, and the autochtone did not have unconsciousness because they they, they looked uh, for them uh, every uh, happy all day long and uh, of course more marque love when he, he told me this story and he said this is because they have never tried to understand the social structure of these societies and in each of course in each society there was one person who was in charge of mental uh, health and uh, if you want um, I start to be very, very aware, let's say 10 years ago, about the way that uh, at some point the whole uh, spectrum of uh, colonialism was, I would not use even colonialism here, I would say colonization, was in an arena of an immaterial arena, the, the, the arena of the psyche, to transform and then uh, reduced actually the imagination, the imaginary of the subject they were occupying in order to then, same aim, extract them of, uh, of value from their body, from their raw material, etc. So it was for me a way to step aside from the classic idea that colonization means occupying the land and, you know, killing people or exploiting bodies. They, they, it was something that still exists after independence, which has been the seeds of another form of uh, consciousness, a Western uh, uh, colonial consciousness. And I was listening recently to uh, Achille uh, Bembe in a, in, a, in a broadcast, I know he's with us today. Uh, he was saying something very interesting, talking about friend, I mean, Western philosophy and African phil uh, philosophy, uh, philosophy africana. He was saying something that I indeed experimented, that in the West, the relation with the subject is always based on the, on the being, you know, the self, uh, Hegel, uh, Kant, Descartes, I think so, I am. It's all about being, you know, l'être. Uh, Sartre, too, l'être et le néant. But in Africa, it's always based on the relation with the relatives. And with the, the, and particularly, this is what I have discovered within my research for the film series, Reasons Oxymoron. It's, it is always based on the relation with the ancestors. And then, this is another another thing. I mean, of course, you can bridge sometimes psychoanalysis because when you lie on the sofa, you also speak about people who are not anymore here. But it's all about you. It's all about. It's it's very much about being in this world. So, I would say, for me, this. I think we are still struggling with this today, particularly in this time of the pandemic, because if I may to jump here to what is happening now. I would say that we are back into not only uh, we are not only back we are we are attending an enhancement. I mean, the whole pandemic is enhancing the process of fragmented of fragmentation of the societies and of the subject. And then it's not about being as a, a, a subject in in the universe, but is 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 being as a subject actually object of the of the, of the capitalism twenty four seven being connected online constantly. What we what we do here is like I would I would speak about it later a therapy of that uh, uh, algorithmic governance, and I, I really think that it's 
extremely interesting and important to understand how uh, the, the genealogy of this colonization of the psyche in order to probably think about form of therapy for the Western, I mean, for the world at large, universal world uh, uh, today, to, to, to try to imagine an horizon for, 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 uh, for, a, for a, a more equal way of life, of living together, based on what the colonialism has been uh, clearly illustrating, of course, uh, animated by capitalism. I think, I, th I think it's very important also to understand this as far as I'm concerned, because my desire is not to going back to the past. It's on the contrary, to understand what, what was this past in order to probably uh, propose or try to repair an horizon for the left today, which is completely fragmented in the, in the worldwide. Kader, can I, yeah. uh, can, sorry, Vitska, go on, go on. Yeah, um, I wanted to interfere here uh, without, um, hopefully without losing uh, the thread, but I was struck by, by two things uh, that you said. One was, um, I began thinking uh, about repair without thinking about it. And you were stress stressing the notion of dreaming. Um, and in my introduction, how I read your works, uh, I mentioned a couple of times that I see your works as repositories of knowledges, various sort of knowledges. Huh? There's, there's knowledge that comes from, let's say, Western academia, um, research practices into the work, but also knowledges from, uh, you know, lived knowledges from various practices, practices of life. And I wonder, I wonder what kind, of, what kind of epistemology you see appearing from this. In other words, what, what is the knowledge that your artwork brings, uh, uh, brings together and how? And perhaps I could also mention that um, at BAC we've been, and, and this was part of our conversations, we've been using the notion of learning objects. This is what, uh, what, we, uh, what we learned from um, uh, remarkable practices of uh, the Netherlands-based artist Jennifer Heisweg, uh, who thinks um, learning objects or, or artworks not necessarily uh, as objects of art the way, uh, the way Western art history, arts theory envisioned it, but essentially, uh, indeed, um, objects that bring together, um, you know, political, aesthetic, experimentation of learnings, kind of waiting for activation when or if needed um, uh, for communities in a way. And, and there might be that something quite similar is happening um, in your work, and you mentioned reasons, oxymoron, so I wonder whether you could speak to this a little bit, so what kind of epistemology, what kind of way of knowing um, uh, it is that uh, you're dreaming through uh, when you think about repair that you didn't think about at the first place. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Uh, I would say that before to, to speak about um, what kind of, um, of knowing I want to bring, what kind of epistemology I want to bring, I would say why. And here we go back again into this discourse of coloniality and not necessarily North-South, but capitalism, 24-7, occupation of our minds, endlessly, colonization of our everyday life. I really do think that, and here I'm quoting Bernard Stiegler in La Société Automatique, uh, who is quoting, by the way, Gilbert Simondon, mm -hmm. the, the, govern, the, the algorithmic governance has been slowly uh, breaking what used to be the cement of the society called the libidinal society, the society of the desire. Lyotard wrote a lot on that, into a society of impulsion, in, a, in an impulsive society. Because of the speed of flight of, uh, used uh, uh, for transmission of data, when you interact with the cloud, with the digital, with, the, uh, with our algorithmic double, we are actually not even faster than the, the information that we think we are, we are thinking about. 
they, it, it's a process that hijack our protection, so our expectation of what we are, what we are, what we want. I think what, what he described uh, as a process, he said that the human uh, beings used to be subject, uh, individual subject, called psychic subject, psychological subject, and collectively they used to be collective. Uh, uh, sorry, they used to be individual uh, psychics as subject, and collectively, individual collective. What we are creating right now, all of us now, it's, it is an individual collective. And this individuation that I'm quoting Simondon is possible when we do share many things, among which knowledge. Knowledge is a way to individualize us, to be together and to grow together, to create a battle of intelligence, to confront, to and for me, the reason to learn is here. Why, why knowing? Why knowledge? Sorry, because we, because I want to rebuild and to recement the, 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 what I used to call the physicality of the community. That's why I have created La Colonie, because I was fed up to see. I'm sorry if I, we are saying this today because of the pandemic, but I really trust that the individuation is possible when we do move into a space and we are collectively together, confronting, argumenting building this individual collective together. And at La Colonie, it happened. So what is in the core stake here is how to invent a decolonial strategy from this algorithmic governance, I would say, by building a new, or let's say building, continuing to elaborate a new epistemology, sharing knowledge, sharing ideas. That's my first thing. And the first thing, after I answered to you why knowledge, I would say how knowledge. <laughs> because it's extremely important to understand that we are living in a time where the majority of the people who are receiving data, information, have not been educated or at least trained into the hermeneutic of what they are receiving. They are not able to interpret correctly, properly, what they learn, what they receive. And that's the second reason I really do think, I would say again, from my modest position as an artist, I'm not a co cognitive scientist or neurologist, that hermeneutic interpretation of text or image needs imagination. When you look at uh, news, could it be fake or true? Your imagination helps you to read and to interpret the image or the text or, the, or, or what you are listening. And that's why for me, the learning object a notion that we have developed together for this project and even before, because there were also other artists doing it, are crucial today. Art can be also this uh, uh, stepping a step aside from a very passive relation between the viewer and the artwork, but something that really helps him to individualize him, himself or, or herself and be part of a community of thinking. Again, confronting intelligence, the battle of intelligence. And I think, I think here we are really like touching what I called a, possi a possible therapeutic, I mean, uh, relation with these, again, I'm quoting here Stigler and Derrida, pharmacon, that is the digital. Pharmacon, because it is both the remedy and the poison. And it's all about how to, uh, like an anesthetist, use carefully the poison, not too much, but, uh, but, but be aware of, the, of this. Wonderful. Can I, can I just very quickly um, just ask about the notion of listening, also in relation as, yeah, perhaps as a methodology that you could see in, again in the reason oxymoron, but in, in very many uh, other artworks. But Witzke reminded me of a quote in reasons oxymoron of Algerian filmmaker Malek uh, uh, Ben Smail, where he talks about how his father's practice in emergency psychiatry was first and foremost a practice of humanist listening. And the quote uh, comes here, listening to what society does not want to hear. And in a similar vein, uh, uh, Ben Smile's role as filmmaker has been to film what society does not want to see. So I wonder whether you see correspondences there with your practices of listening and perhaps not only deep listening, but li deep hearing, if you will. 
No, of course. I mean, uh, the Reaper uh, has always been, uh, for me, an extremely complex um, uh, notion in the sense that it's not only polysemous, but it also carries, uh, I would say, different um, yeah, uh, it needs different, I would say, mediums or tech or, or tools to be to be to be to be understood or to be at least felt or whatsoever. Uh, Malek Ben Smail is a is a filmmaker. His father was the director of the psychiatric hospital in Constantine. It's a very good reference, uh, Maria. Thank you for reminding us this because I asked him indeed as a, as a filmmaker how the camera how the camera was actually uh, who was basically the patient. Was it the director or the people he was interviewing? And he told me something fantastic. He said, you know, in Algeria, if you want to do, a, I mean, I think in many countries, but if you want to do a stupid film, you get immediately found. But when you want to just interview the people in the street, you, you're going to have a hard time to fundraise your film. And he sa I said, why? He said, but it's because the documentary as a, pra as a, as a practice, is really like definitely the real cinema for this country. So I think if we consider that the cinema comes from a projection of the mind, uh, some many thinkers have been developing the idea that cinema could have been invented anyway, because the, since we live in caves, we have been I mean, projecting our uh, uh, ideas in dreams. Uh, mm. So we have inside our brains a small projector that is every night when we sleep, projecting as a film. Uh, I do. I do think that this this sort of uh, uh, question of listening is extremely interesting in the sense that it's the perfect mirror. It's the perfect mirror of projection. You know of externalization of the memory into an image, into an object, into a world with language, uh, needs someone to watch or to listen. So it's like, it's, for, me, for me, really listening is, is one of the crucial aspects of the repair. It's like, it's the complementarity of, of the desire of repair, but more than that, I think. And I have to, to finish here with someone I really like also. She's an Algerian psychoanalyst, Karima Lazali who wrote The Colonial Trauma. And with Karima, I have discovered something that I did not suspect it before, I have to say, which is the absence, the silence. How much this, what I was explaining right now, agency of the human mind to produce externalized images, externalized memories into objects, can also produce nothing, and it means something. And here we get really deep into psycho psychotic, I don't know in English how you say it, but psychosis, but also into something I've been, I mean, within all my researches, there's another uh, psychoanalyst, like a uh, Jungian from uh, Lith Lithuania, who influenced me a lot, Grazina Gudaite, from Vilnius, who also explained carefully that the trauma leave an absence, which for her is the ground for the complex of inferiority. Mm. And for Gradzina Gudeite, she said that when the complex of inferiority is never too far, we have to be careful. Father, um, we actually don't have that much time and we have so many questions. So maybe we can talk a bit about your new work, which is, um, which is being made now and it will you will be making it throughout the course of uh, this project it's commissioned by buck and it's um takes the form of a of a podcast and i'm interested to talk about it about what you said before about how to build a decolonial strategy um within this algorithmic governance um, it also touches on deep listening what maria uh, was asking before in, in the form of a podcast you you will be talking with um, with various people on the issue of mental health, um, uh, the psychological duress that are experienced, especially in the education environment, um, 
So you're talking with students, um, student activist organizers, many academics from Utrecht, but also internationally. Um, and um, it's these one-on-one -on -one conversations that you are doing, um, which will be done online. Uh, so I'd like to dwell a bit more on the possibility of refiguring the social, of building a grammar, if you will, of being together while we're all staring at the screens. Um, in what way is this new work as a podcast um, a form of creative resistance that works with the medium and the media and media of digital space, but um, otherwise? So maybe to put it differently, in what way does this work inhabit the format of the podcast that goes beyond the literal use of the podcast? I mean, uh, it, you name it, uh, I, I'm definitely, like many all of us, uh, fascinated by a podcast uh, and what this sort of uh, um, device and, and technology is turning on in your own uh, consciousness, you know, it's a relation with time and the voice and uh, something you listen. But at the same time, I think if we go back into the, 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 the and probably we have to talk about this today because of the relation we that has left to us uh, because of the pandemic, if we go back to the notion of algorithmic governance, the way that uh, a whole articulation of our behavior, or a whole captation, basically, capture of all behaviors are uh, feeding a, a, a data mining economy, we should wonder less literally how to use uh, media. I think the podcast and any social media is a device to definitely communicate uh, and, and, and then to open conversations. But if you stay on the surface of the, of the, uh, of the yeah, in, in, a, in a very literal uh, uh, use of the media, I think you can miss what I was talking about before when I, sp I spoke about the individuation, the need of building not a community, I'm not into that, huh? but just a consciousness of an individual collective. Because, again, what is at the... Uh, uh, the core stake of what is happening today, it's an acceleration. And I have to admit that what art works brings me, maybe there will be many artists who will disagree, I understand, but as far as I'm concerned, artworks are slowing them down machine. They are, they are machine let me, make, let, let me make a long story short. I really do consider that the human mind has been constantly inventing technology to speed time, to be faster in action. Alphabet is a machine, the alphabet. And artworks, it's the contrary. It's, it's, it, is, it, is, it is a machine that slows time. It is a machine that helps you to do not die in present. It brings you through time. It is an anti-spontaneous and anti-immediate machine. And then the, 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 the need to gather voices uh, uh, through the media of the podcast, for me, is to really re-invite uh, uh, a temporality of uh, Im uh, a way to imagine together a, a collective individual through this exchange of dialogues. So obviously, Talking about the pandemic uh, in the podcast will be, I mean, won't be the main topic, but it will be always behind, will be always the spectrum of our conversation when we, where, when we will be talking about psychology, about time, about imagination, reappropriation of a certain imaginary. Um, I mean, definitely, I would say making visible both uh, the political uh, uh, invisibility uh, of this alg uh, algorithmic governance. For instance, I think we spoke about it recently, the whole uh, jobs that are making uh, us uh, connected on Facebook, on Twitter, on whatever, by these millions of people who are moderating the image and the message, for instance, just an example, all, all these millions of people who are making these 
uh, enhancement of the uh, uh, algorithmic govern governance possible that are completely invisibilized. There is an opacity here that I can't stand. I think to elaborate a conversation on this invisibility is crucial. Because in the end of the day, again, we are, we are back into uh, 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 the core stake of the question is this hegemony of the capitalism 24 seven. Mm -hmm. Because the reason we have been hijacked from our own uh, uh, in, impulsions, it's because we are endlessly connected. So this is one aspect that will be spoken on, on, on the podcast. Kader, um, we're out of time speaking about slowing uh, uh, time, slowing uh, machines. And there is so much to discuss, but fortunately we will have you back at the end of the day again in a conversation. And, uh, and many times throughout the, this series of gatherings, so I really look forward to going in depth uh, for a couple of issues, uh, uh, not the least the notion of instituting otherwise, which is so dear for us at Buck, and for which we, we've been really looking uh, um, with admiration toward uh, La Colonie. And uh, we would like to switch to La Colonie in couple of, a couple of uh, minutes, La Colonie Nomad, uh, at La Dynamo uh, in Paris in a couple of minutes. But before that, I'd like to uh, bring us into the exhibition to uh, uh, get a sense of um, um, the installation perhaps, but also see whether we can include the uh, voices of the artworks in this uh, assembly, in this uh, constellation. So I just want to thank you for now. We'll see you later. And uh, thank you so much, Witzke. And um, uh, we just move to the exhibition now. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back, or welcome, in, uh, in case you just tuned in for this uh, opening gathering of the uh, program project Fragments of uh, Repair, a multi-part uh, project convened by BAC together with artists Kader Atia and um, a decolonial forum, uh, La Colonie in Paris. Now, uh, we will soon switch live broadcast from here in Utrecht to Paris to La Dynamo in Paris for a lecture by uh, Françoise Verger, uh, a lecture titled Get Mad, Fight Back, Tools to Resist the Economy of Exhaustion. But, but before that, I'd like to briefly introduce you a fragment from this exhibition. And um, you can see two works here behind me. That's the work Oil and Sugar, that's just temporarily switched off, uh, from 20, 2007. Uh, perhaps something to look at uh, in, in particular in connection to the notion of pharmacon that uh, Kader was mentioning in the conversation just now. But I'd like to read a brief excerpt of uh, uh, f um, uh, speaking about the work that is on my left, and that's La Tour Robespierre, which is a video work from 2018. Allow me to read quickly so that uh, uh, it helps me a little bit to control uh, my time now. Latour Robespierre, the Robespierre Tower, is a drone-recorded portrait of a massive modernist housing, housing tower in a Paris suburb, named after a key figure, of course, of French Revolution. The recording unveils a stark contradiction to the French Revolution's ideals of universal equality, as well as to modernist architecture's promise of democratic housing. A residential high-rise in Paris's urban periphery, the banlieue, conveys the near untenable reality of public housing. Even though once propagated as egalitarian architecture, it has since become synonymous with the racial othering that plagues its residents, many of whom are working class and often descendants of uh, former French colonies. Now, since through today's COVID-19 pandemic lens, Latour Robespierre cannot but remind us of how systemic racial, class and gender disparities interlace with public, physical, mental and emotional health inequities. The overcrowded, massive apartment block becomes the virus's preferred habitat. Multi-generational households, the socioeconomic reality of often people of color with no working from home opportunities, venturing into city as essential workers to sustain the privileged, and the individuals whose bodily and psychological vulnerabilities are intensified by suboptimum living conditions. A lockdown in this environment often provides a convenient pretext for even heavier policing and securitization of already disproportionately precarized lives. It recalls the origin point of containment and curfews, the military prison psychopathological complex that arose in direct lineage from early colonial policy. Yet, as the work Latour Robespierre browses the surface of the uniform aesthetic uh, order, it deliberately averts the impulse to identify, register, and contain the contesting urban population inhabiting it. Without puncturing the monotone facade uh, to further invade the people's lives, uh, the work respects that they maintain their right to exist beyond scrutiny. And let me from here um, shift to um, Françoise, uh, Françoise Verger and uh, to La Colonie Nomade, hosted uh, generously uh, at La Dynamo uh, in Paris. I would like to first introduce Françoise Verger, uh, who is a political theorist, feminist, independent curator and decolonial activist. Verger received her degree in political science and women's studies at the University of California, San Diego, and finished her PhD in political science at the University of California in Berkeley. She has taught at the University of Sussex, Brighton, Goldsmiths University of London, University of California, Berkeley, and Brown University, Rhode Island. Between 2004 and 2010, Verger was part of the culture and scientific program of the Museum and Culture Center of Civilization and Unity, Reunion Island, and between 2009 and 2012, was president of France's National Committee for the Remembrance and History of Slavery. 
She has published extensively on slavery, postcolonial theory, psychoanalysis, and decolonial feminism. Verger published work, uh, the published work includes, and I cite here, uh, the English translations of their titles, Monsters and Revolutionaries, Colonial Family Romance and Metissage, 1999, The Wombs of Women, Race, Capital, Feminism, from 2017, Resolutely Black, um, Conversation with Aimé Césaire, 2020, a Decolonial Feminism, 2019, and A Feminist Theory of Violence in 2020. Verger currently lives and works in Paris, and this is just to state it one more time, where she will be uh, speaking to us, uh, uh, to us from. Uh, let's switch to La Colonie uh, Nomade. Thank you, Francoise. So, I reprends for my first phrase. There are reasons to get mad, seriously mad. People, poor, black, indigenous, brown people, are losing jobs and homes, are getting sick. Migrants and refugees are being hunted, chased and killed. Fascism is coming back in new or old clothes. Women are murdered. Prisons are overcrowded. People are fleeing, devastating hurricanes, flood, wars and fire. COVID-19 has unleashed an economic storm that hit the poor and vulnerable hardest, with women and marginalized workers facing the worst of job loss. More than 100 million people could be pushed in extreme poverty. Had to this the fact that billionaires are getting richer, that they can education, health, art, and development. Had to this that despite warning by scientists and activists, no measure is being taken to slow down the destruction of the basic living condition for human life, nor to stop the economy of, ex of exhaustion that is depleting the life force and energy of billions of people in the global south. Add to this, in the global south and women of color in the north will bear the heavier burden of the current crisis. Nearly 30% of all women employed globally work into the four most affected industries by the pandemic, hotel, restaurant, retail, and manufacturing. They account for more than 75% of all unpaid care work in the world. They constitute the majority of workers in the cleaning industry, and notably in social services, 90%. And with girls, they dedicate roughly more than 12 billion hours to unpaid work every day. Due to the overload of domestic work, 40% of women in the world are excluded from the labor market compared to 6% of men. There are indeed many reasons to get mad. We have been living through a crisis for century, a humanity crisis. We are still living in the age of the man. Who Caribbean philosopher Sylvia Winter, using Franz Fanon's theory of sociogenesis, situate after the existence, after the Colombian encounter in, you know, comma, of, 19, of 1492. A moment, she said, being vital to the formulation of European presentation of the human, which epistemologically foreclosed a way of being human otherwise. Winter called excavating the form of humanness disavowed by the exclusionary category of man. And she had that, I quote, all our present struggle with respect to race, class, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, struggle over the environment, global warming, severe climate change, the sharply unequal distribution of the Earth's resources belong to the struggle between the ethnoclass man and human. We are not yet in the age of the human. There is no end to murder, no end to anti-blackness, anti-indigeneity, to Islamophobia, and to feminicide. How do we repair a world that feed on the wound, damage, harm, grief, and trauma it produced? A world whose very survival depends on their perpetuation. Repair comes from the Latin reparare, to restore, to put back in order. The act of restoring, of restoration after decay. After decay. What kind of restoration is possible when the decay accumulated since colonial slavery 
has reached an amount that we cannot even measure. What is irreparable? What has been so damaged that it cannot be mended? In an interview that I made in 2004, Aimé Césaire said that slavery was irreparable. He was suspicious of a politic of reparation that would conclude with chapter close, move on. His ancestor, he say, had not come freely to Martinique, but in the hold of the slave ship. They had been kidnapped, terrorized, and thrown naked onto the shore of a land they did not know. They had no clue about this language, culture, social organization. They were made into objects. They were denied the right to make kin, to make family, to make community. They enter the master house, the world it made, and the world which has made it as subhuman. They dream of dismantling it, and they imagine the tools that will do it. They never stop fighting, which will then perhaps look at their struggle as fragment of repair. To imagine fragment of repair, we need to make a leap of imagination, create the apparatus that will operate a temporal rupture with the age of predation, exhaustion. Fragment, because the repair will never be complete, because total worldness is unattainable and not even something to wish for. We must live, we, sorry, we must learn to live with irreparability, to live with the scars and the grammar of hope. We must acknowledge that some of us will be lost because for them, trauma and damage are impossible to bear. Melancholia, thought of suicide, morbid thought, practice of automutilation or violence unto other are their only way to deal with the violent and daily ritual of racial and sexist humiliation and with the violence they encounter within society or heteropatriarchal family. We must learn to offer them some solace and be aware of the destructive power upon the psyche of racism, sexism, homophobia, and systemic violence, of the economy of exhaustion that deplete the body and the mind. Since racial capitalism, heteropatriarchy, and imperialism are unable to stop the economy of predation, devastation, extraction, and exhaustion, of bodies, ocean, forest, land, soil, subsoil, rivers, plant and animal, because it is the very foundation of their survival. Since colonization is their organizing principle and dispossession, privatization of land, water and air, and commodification their way of constantly extending their power. Since nothing must escape, escape their unsatisfied appetite for domination and for the pleasure of inflicting pain, their unsatisfied ap appetite for the appropriation of objects, notion, narrative, image, and concept, how do we practice fragment of repair? I suggest that we already consider the entangled temporality of repair, the past that is barely repaired, with repair is still going on. The century of accumulated wound on the planet, people, animals, and plant. Repairing the open vein of the planet that the economy of extraction leaves behind. The ruin, the waste, wasted body, and wasted land. The present, and its politic of imminent death and destruction. And the future, since we know that past and current destruction are threatening the life of future generation. We know that children in the global south and in minority in the global north will have no childhood. That around the world, children are criminalized, treated as adults, condemned at birth to premature death. Because the right to childhood is not yet a universal right. The process of unchiding, which Palestinian legal scholar Nadira Shaloub Kervokian described as, I quote, the understanding of children as political capital in the end of those in power, the political work of violence designed to create, direct, govern, transform, and construct colonial children as dangerous, racialized others, enabling their eviction for the realm of childhood itself is now global. To this untangled temporality, we must have the temporality of urgency. Someone is drowning, we rush to rescue. Someone is thirsty, we rush to bring water. Someone is bleeding, 
we rush to stop the bleeding. Someone is crying, we rush to hold her in our arms. Someone is dying, we hold her hand and caress her face. And the temporality of healing, which is much longer. This entangled temporality demands an effort of conceptualization. The West does not lack entangled temporality. Its past is for glorious remembrance and its future for glorious living. Along with this entangled temporality, we must add entangled spatiality of repair. The body, the mind, the social, the plant, the animal, the water, the air, and the phantom presence of what has been lost. I was, I'm thinking, for instance, of Kader Atia work on the phantom member. A difficult exercise that demands a shifting in thought. And again, I insist, imagination, letting our mind go free. But first, get mad, fight back. Offer a glass of water, a blanket, help migrant and refugee to cross border, create route of rescue, fight racist law, destroy the wall that divide and separate, publish, educate. Attack the structure of systemic and structural violence, build sanctuaries and refuge, set up school, forge false paper, facilitate route of fugitive, fugitivity, escape and marooning. Examine further what we are against, I turn to the architecture and structure of the master house yesterday and today, to the world it created and creates, and upon which it depended and depends. I'm not suggesting an unchanged spatial and cultural arrangement, but the existence of a form, of an architecture, of a structure that connects different nodes of power and whose accumulation of wealth is based on the economy of extraction and exhaustion. It is a world that produces enormous amount of suffering enormous amount of west, wasted land and wasted lives. Its power rests on pacification, neutralization, and terror. Its wars leave behind wounds, trauma, distress, dread, and mental suffering that lasts through generation, as well as a ton of toxic junk whose polluting capacity lingers also for generation. Its laws of protection of women and children enforce the division between those who deserve protection and those who do not. It means looking at the century of colonial slavery and their connection with modernity and the world making and as their afterlives in Brazil, Africa, Africa, Mexico, United States and Europe. At the North and South divide, at the militarization of life, at the gap between discovery and progress in technologies, science, medicine that are presented as neutral, but, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, as neutral and for all mankind, and the fabrication of disposable life, and the fact that, as Rus Benjamin has shown, this technology generates pattern of social relation, and these become black box as natural, inevitable, automatic, engineering racial inequity. The master house is no longer exclusively found in the global north. Its architecture is replicated in the enclave for the wealthy that we find in cities throughout the world, in the sheer logic of extraction and exhaustion, in the backlash of patriarchy. Thinking about it historically in the present means defin defining already what we call the present. We should not be confused with the contemporary. The present is a position in the way Michel Rolf Trouillot has conceived pastness rather than the past. It is a field of practice that impact on the way in which we imagine reparative justice and the humanization of the world. About the master house, let me start, of course, with a remark Audre Lorde made in 1984, and with part on dismantling the master house has since become a source of reflection and debate. The full paragraph reads, and I quote, those of us who stand outside the circle of the society definition of acceptable woman, those of us who have been forged in the crucibles of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbian, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. It is learning how to take our difference and make them strength. For the master's tool will never dismantle the master house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring 
about genuine change. The master house is a house of racist patriarchy and racist feminism, cleaned by women of color who take care of his children while his life goes shopping or to feminist conference. His architecture and the world he built and which built it rested on a series of rules, who could live inside, who was recruited to make the master life possible and comfortable, but whose work was made invisible and should never disturb his own sense of existence. Looking for arrangement, for appeasement, for being accepted in the corridor or in a corner of his dining room will never dismantle his house. A leap of imagination is needed and the building of solidarity relationality and political belonging. Utopian thinking in the world of dystopia that the master has produced for centuries. Utopian thinking as maroning, as knowing that behind the permanent state of war, the survival of the master house demand, there is a possibility for peace, for peacefulness and relationality. The master house was historically the house of the man, whose wealth and capital accumulation was based on the extraction and exhaustion of mine, of gold and silver, of labor in the mine and in the plantation of sugar, coffee, indigo, tobacco, and cotton. Colonial mine of silver and gold and plantation led to a reorganization of the world economy and to the impoverishment of Asia, Africa, and the Americas. To mine gold and silver, slavery mine indigenous and black human energy and life force to death. Extraction required terror. The flesh and bones of indigenous and black body mix with the earth in plantation and in mine. They were the humus of capitalism. The law of private property, enslavement and rape became indispensable. Without rape and the capitalization of the black woman's womb, the master house will have collapsed. Slavery, Christina Sharp has written, turned the womb into a factory, producing blackness as abjection, much like the slave ship hold and the prison. In a world where the black body was capital, where work was made cheap, nature was also made cheap, there for the enjoyment and the profit of the master. In a billion black Anthropocene or known, Catherine Yusuf described the original moment of extraction exhaustion in Ghana, which was also called, as you know, the Gold Coast. And she write about, I quote, the transformation of mineralogy of the earth in the extraction of gold, silver, salt, and copper to the massive transformation of ecologies in the movement of people, plant, and animal across territory, coupled with the intensive implantation of monoculture, of tobacco, indigo, cotton, sugar, and other alien ecology in what was called the new world. The global economy of extraction exhaustion not only shaped the way non-white life and environment were conceived, but transformed geology and mineralogy. What I have chosen to call racial capitalism and other have called plantanocene or anthropocene started then. Imposing in Africa and their development, the economy of giving away resources, human and other, and a terrible loss of life. The master house was deeply patriarchal, and yet the law of private property and whiteness overpowered male domination. White women who were constructed as docile and fragile, in need of their father, brother, or husband protection, were in fact very savvy and skilled when it came to the commerce in flesh. Since they were more often, sin, sorry, since they more often inherited slave than land, their father gave them slave rather than land, the land were for the, for the son. They understood very well that enslaved human were their private capital, and they were very careful to deprive their husband of power over the capital. The complicity of white women in colonial slavery, their understanding of the relation between private property, status, and capital, and the protection they offered show that white women were not only, as historian Anne-Laura Soler has argued, sent to the colony to discipline white men. In the age of dehumanization, they were its active accomplice. As historian Stephanie Jones Rogers has written, white women never express any hesitation to enter the slave market in the south of the United States and elsewhere as well, and to bargain 
cell and by human being without demonstrating any innate female sense of empathy. The gender binary that the open state sought to impose was never as rigid as it pretended to be. True, as Maria Lugones has shown, coloniality was gender. It criminalized sexualities and imposed rigid form of masculinity and femininity management. But if it enforced gender boundary, it also banned them where their interests were at stake. Enslaved women and enslaved black women were forced to work as hard as men in the field, were punished as brutally as men, were forced to give birth in the field and had no day off for nurturing their newborn child. They were met into sexual objects, but they were required to show tenderness and affection to the master children and his wife. The filth of white patriarchy was hidden between, behind the romance of chivalry and paternity. The master house was not the house of gallantry and cultural manner that female novels have presented, but horrors and cruelty. There always was a libidinal dimension in his exercise of domination, in displaying publicly his absolute power to torture, rape, and kill. Yet the master house was constructed as a domain of cleanliness, manners, and civilization, standing apart from the enclosed world of non-white. Europe, says the, said the colonial fiction, was a cradle of cleanliness and hygiene, two key elements in the making of the discourse of superior civilization. And yet, let's remember that when Crusader invaded the Middle East in the 12th century, Arabs were at, astonished and horrified by their disregard for personal cleanliness. Later, when Europeans debarked in Africa, Asia, and the Americas, natives could not also believe that human beings could be so indifferent to their own hygiene. However, by the 19th century, Europe had traced a strong racial contrast between a clean Europe, clean European body, versus dirty indigenous dwelling, dirty body, dirty sexuality, unhealthy habit of food, care, and health, erasing their own responsibility on the wasting away of cities, environment, and body. This is something that is still with us and which we saw during the pandemic as the pandemic demonstrated again this division between clean and unclean. The plantation was the domain of the master house. It was the historical form in which the extraction of life, of human and non-human life, was organized on an industrial scale for the production of commodities and profit, Rolando Vasquez has written. The plantation was linked to bank, insurance, stock market, arm industry, international law, tribunal, the church, and to the world making of modernity, shaped by geography, botany, travel diaries, and later, photography, ethnology, and cinema. It, its world was limited and limitless. If the border of the plantation was severely enforced for the enslaved, the master needed to have access to the larger world to fructify his capital. If his plantation will never have survived with making the black woman womb into a capital and blackness into abjection, it will never have survived either without global connection. He was dependent on the domination and militarization of the seas, carefully organized by European power as early as you know, the early 18th century. Without the development of maritime power, no slave trade, no colonial slavery, no colonialism, no imperialism, no commerce, no wars of conquest. Rivers, lakes, seas, and ocean were instrumental to colonial exploration and conquest. Europe named the sea, the river, the ocean, and mapped the maritime world, erasing non-European knowledge of navigation and the sea. Colonial slavery and post-slavery imperialism constructed a land-sea continuum of power. It ignored and undermined the understanding by non-European people of the land-water continuum. The link they made between land, river, lakes, shores, seas, and ocean of which we can find many examples in the Mediterranean, Indian Ocean, or Pacific. The world of the plantation developed a pedagogy of cruelty, which imposed the inscription of cruelty onto the indigenous black and brown body, which was made into a territory upon which the message of dehumanization was written, especially if the body was female. Extractivism, 
I repeat, was inseparable from disposition, exploitation, and exhaustion, and from processes of racialization, and all must be understood simultaneously. Both slavery, colonialism, and imperialism continue to, con to use the same tools. They use a silver, salt, gold, sugar, cotton, coffee, indigo, rubber, all cobalt, or all mark with blood and sorrows. Today, the master house and its world are still made possible by the extraction and exhaustion of black, indigenous, and brown body. But there are new actors, rentier government, emerging power, and bankers, entrepreneurs in the global south. But the border of, of its world are still heavily guarded by the police of private guard or mercenary, or mercenaries, by walls, by the racial, social, and gender segregation of public space. Women of color are still allowed into the master house, but always as servants and by the back door. They enter the gates of the city, of its control building, but as phantom. They circulate in the city, but only as an erased presence. In the current reworking of the geopolitics of cleanliness, dirtiness, the invisibility of the cleaning job of women of color create the visibility of clean home and public space. Other members of superfluous community, their family, neighbors, must stay behind the gates. If they transgress the rule, they risk being killed by the police or by private armed guard. The world of the master house still extends beyond the limit of the plantation or the urban enclave in which it stands. Hegemony upon rivers, oceans, and seas are still of utmost importance, and seas, rivers, oceans, lakes are still the site of intense competition between power, a site of growing appropriation, militarization, and pollution. What the railroad was to 19th century imperialist expansion, port and tankers are to the 21st century. Remember, sometimes you know, numbers are important to, to say. 90% of global trade is still done with ships. 70% of the oil consumed globally goes through an ocean. 90% of digital communication is made through underwater cables. The increasing privatization of water is stressing a new cartography of political and military power, masculine, mm -hmm. that reveal alliance between militarization and science. The extraction, you know, the, the dredging, the destruction of mangrove, of mudflat, of marine e ecosystem, the extraction of sand, which is one of the world's biggest threatened community by volume and contribute to the exhaustion of community environment. We so often forget the role and place of seas and ocean in the organization of white supremacy, imperialism and control of production consumption, that we remain attached to a land-based cartography of struggle and repair. But today, 30 mineral contractors are already mining the deep sea. Their ships bring up thousands of kilos of sediment, sold them for metal, polymetallic nodules, and throw back what is useless into the sea, leading to terrible environmental damage and the destruction of living wood of entire community. Even, you know, gold is extracted now from coastal water. Rivalry over access to bodies of water have intensified to gain commercial and strategic advantage. For the US Navy, and this I'm reading you an excerpt from a report from the, of the Pentagon, national zone of exclusivity will inevitably expand ever further into the ocean until they meet in the middle, creating a no man's land, or rather a no man's sea, where both sides venture only at grave peril. After a century in which freedom of maneuver was a norm in naval operation, much of the ocean will be carved up into impassable killing field. And this is already happening in the Mediterranean and also in the Indian Ocean and Pacific. Island, artificial and natural, are transformed into military base or present camp for refugees, for instance, in Greece or the island of Nauru in the Pacific, or the island of Basan Shah, where Bangladesh wants to send, you know, all the Rohingya refugees. They also, you know, a lot of military. The master house always enforce rules to limit circulation. A black geography of water and land show the structural and systemic racism that govern the circulation. Whereas young women, Western women and men are encouraged to travel and discover the world, to find oneself through the journey abroad, whose travel have been celebrated as adventure, 
young African, Asian, or South American are denied the right to circulate and desire for autonomy, even more so if they are women. Migrant and refugee who transgress the master borders are threatened with death. The migrants, but migrants often refuse to see themselves only as victim. They perceive themselves as the true adventurer of the 21st century, demonstrating courage, bravery, and audacity. In an archipelago of solidarities, philosopher Christian Voller recalled how a group of young Senegalese and Cameroonian laughed when she asked them about the difficulty they had endured. They asked her first to explain why your country was so racist, for us. And they say they saw themselves as travelers who had overcome huge danger and obstacle thanks to their temerity, their endurance, and their friendship. The narrative demonstrated collectivity and belonging in practice. Similarly, many of the African women migrants interviewed by sociologist Camille Scholl in The Wretch of the Sea, Les Danes et Eux, refused to be seen as victims and challenged the NGOs and state norms which wanted to transform them into passive, defenseless, and compliant women to be saved. This is not to undermine the suffering, the trauma, the mental health problem of migrants and refugees, but to say that the refusal of those who escape a master house to be categorized as victims show that they understand deeply what marooning entails, what is at stake when one transgress the border. Dismantling the master house cannot be a land-based project. It has to include a decolonization of the continuum land sea, a reappropriation of the philosophy of living that conceives Earth as a living, connected world. Repairing the planet enters the planetary approach. We must refuse to be locked on land and fight against the new borders twice on the sea. I mean, we must not land the sea in the end of soldiers and capitalists, because otherwise, the sea, when it is not a site of vacation and rest for Westerners, will remain a vast cemetery of body whose only sepulture is unmarked water. It's also a dumping, will be a dumping for toxic waste. Liquid extractivist capitalism is absolutely linked also to the expansion of agro-extractivist capitalism. The vast new plantation of sugar, palm oil, and soy or eucalyptus today that are created today in Africa, Asia, and South America are the same condition of past slave plantation, rape, and violence are systematic and structural. Let's reflect on what Sayak Valencia has called gore capitalism, the many instances of dismembering and disoberwelment over often tied with organized crime, gender, and the predatory use of body. Dismembered women are thrown in garbage dump in Mexico, illustrating the connection patriarchy and gore capitalism are making between female body and garbage. Extractivism, exhaustion, and suffocation are consubstantial. The struggle for the right to breath is a struggle against police violence, tear gas, bomb, and against making the air irrespirable. If according to the World Health Organization, more people are dying every year of polluted water than of any other cause, dying of suffocation is also caused by police violence, political repression, and censorship. Making the air is irrespirable is not just a matter of polluted air, it's also a political strategy against people of color. I can breathe bring to light the objectives of the neoliberal racist politic of imminent death. Level upon level of waste, of racism, neoliberalism, imperialism, are asphyxiating the planet and people. Some tools, that's the conclusion. Between March 23 and 29, a ship belonging to Evergreen, one of the largest ship owners in the world, blocked the Suez Canal, holding up 40, 442 ships for a few days. There was panic in the financial and shipping world and among the producing and exporting company. A shortage of goods was feared. What this episode showed though, which you know, media were careful to hide, was that the very old tactic of blocking the chain of production consumption remain a very powerful tool for fighting back. Let us imagine a series of blockages through the world. 
the international women's strike, answering the call made by Andres Malm to force fossil to uh, to stop uh, fossil fuel extraction by blowing up some oil pipeline, blocking sheep, blocking the arm industry. People are marching. People are doing it. People are starting to do it. And they are marching in the street of Algiers, Tunis, Mexico, Buenos Aires, Hong Kong, Bangkok, and Warsaw. And everywhere, those in power are trying to lash back with all, you know, violence. But nothing, if nothing forbid us to imagine how to block all this during our Paris-based school, La Colonie, imagining fragment of repair will start perhaps among us by looking at the way in which, as I wrote in the program, exhaustion, mental and bodily depression is endemic to capitalism. Capitalism is premised on, on extractivists that produce a constant exhaustion of all form and force of living, human and animal, ocean and river and water, for the well-being of a select few. Exhaustion is not just impacting the body, it impacts the psyche. It divides, separates, and encourages war of all against all. In its economy feeds stress, anxiety, morbid thought, and feeling of isolation. Imagining fragment of repair, we'll be looking also at the way in which we live with a phantom part of our body psyche. By forbidding people of color, trans, queer, sex worker to make kinship or to make community, and we know in France, you know, how the state is absolutely even, you know, making laws to forbid community making, capitalism and heteropatriarchy fabricate loneliness and induce relationality. In the seventh session we will be doing in Paris for the School La Colony, we will first try to create a space of relationality. We will go slowly, allow for silence and gesture of repair. We will start from our strength rather than our weakness. We will affirm the strengths. We will remain humble in our search for fragment of repair. Our method will be to listen, to learn to weave all the thread, to learn to mend. We are a very diverse group, artists, students, activists, psychoanalysts, curators, and also those who are setting uh, the oasis, our block archive in the making, and everyone. We will have two open sessions, one open to migrant and refugee, the other to young curator. But nothing is entirely plain. We will see as we go, and from one session to the other. We may change our focus, remain open to the unexpected and the unforeseen. It is a collective and collaborative work, neither a seminar nor the presentation of each work and interest. It is about inventing collective thought and practice of repair. As of today, for instance, I cannot say what kind of creation, performance we will do, you know, for the last session that we imagine doing with people of Ponta, for the people of Ponta. The objective is to offer, you know, at one point, something, to create something. But we are here, protected in La Dinamo, but we cannot ignore what's happening just there, outside. Racism, the assault on activists, the censorship, the Islamophobia, the increased poverty, the impunity of the powerful, the impoverishment of artists, people who are not eating properly every day, the return of the French trend of fascism, the violence of neoliberalism, the, you know, the police. This is also our context. But we must also keep in mind how fortunate we are to be generally, generously hosted by La Dynamo, to work with Bac Utrecht, to be able to listen to sister and brother in struggle, to be in a warm and protected space in a time of renewed crisis and a sort of right. Fragment of repair is really to think about perhaps not necessarily a fragmented world, but a life in which the different pieces of our lives are put together. I think that we must have also to relearn how to survive as Maroon underground, learning perhaps to sue again and to be a refugee, to forge fake papers, because as I say, our enemy are determined. Imagining and practicing the art of repairing will be our task for the seventh session we have. So get mad, fight back. Get mad, fight back. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Thank you so much for your thoughts and ideas and tools. Um, and in particular, the 
uh, temporality of urgency that you so urgently present it, I think really quite important, get mad, fight back. Thank you again. We'll uh, get you back in the conversation at the end of, uh, of the day. Um, I want to one more time uh, apologize for the technical glitch, but also thank all of them, uh, all of those who readily uh, really fixed this in a, a nearly no time. So thank you so very, uh, very much. We're going to try to make up for the uh, lost time and we're going to go immediately in another uh, exhibition fragment before uh, uh, the lecture of Catherine Malabu. So I hope to see you in one minute. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're moving to um, uh, a lecture by Catherine Malabu but we would like to see whether we can have that lecture and a conversation within and with this artwork that Kader already mentioned a couple of times or was discussed during the, during the uh, introductory uh, conversation uh, earlier uh, today. That's the work uh, from 2015, work uh, titled uh, Reasons Oxymoron. Uh, uh, for the sake of time management, I'm going to again uh, do a quick read from a guidebook of the exhibition so that I uh, introduce, uh, albeit in imperfect manner, of a reading a text, uh, this work. The work inquires into ways of dealing with trauma and injury by bringing together various cultural practices and perspectives from around the world regarding subjectivity, the psyche, and imagination. The cultural specificities of the concept of repair are developed across 18 video chapters archived under headings such as reason and politics, uh, the magical science, sciences, religion, language, uh, modernity, capitalism and schizophrenia, religion, language, mod, uh, uh, the group and the individual. The interviewed protagonists hold a wealth of expertise and competence in fields ranging from psychiatry to ethnography, storytelling, shamanism, philosophy, history, music, etc. While enacted in the West as a strategy to correct or hide imperfections and brokenness, in non-Western contexts, repair often involves embracing the scar as a natural part of healing, honoring thus the traces of past wounds as a reservoir of resistance and learning. The work recognizes this West-non-West -West divide and highlights the continued colonization of the psyche in the mandatory assimilation of disparate cultures into a hegemonic constellation. In the case, for example, with refugees who experience psychological trauma when forced to integrate into Western socio-political compound that prioritizes individuality above all else. Yet by embracing contradictions of reason, if you will, and employing both the intuitive and the rational, Reason's oxymorons uh, refuses to succumb to reproducing the simplistic East, uh, East, West, or West, non-West uh, binaries, and unfolds instead as a multivocal, multi-perspectival, and multi-talented archive, pondering the human condition of radical social, uh, psychical, and emotional interdependence. As you can see, the videos are install installed on computer monitors inside anonymous, standardized, prefabricated gray office cubicles. Prototyped actually at the height of Western modernist utopia as the shining example of autonomy, flexibility, and progress, the, pu the, the, the cubicle became instead a signifier of the architecture of control as well as the atomization, precarization, and disposability of workers. Despite its post-panoptic architecture of control and surveillance, the visitor is invited to freely chart their own course through the maze in a way that traverses its reductive compartmentalization, forming connections between perspectives that collectively probe new pathways toward decolonial repair in asynchronous course. With the next lecture by Catherine Malabu titled New Subliminalities, the Psychic Locus of Decoloniality, we will be adding, as it were, 
yet another extraordinary voice to this chorus. To briefly introduce Catherine, Catherine Malabu is a philosopher, writer, and researcher. She's affiliated with the Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy at Kingston University in London as a professor of philosophy and with the Department of Comparative Literature at the University of California, Irving. One of Malabu's central concepts has been that of plasticity, a thinking of how structures and forms of life previously considered rigid are in fact plastic and in constant mutation and transformation. In her writing, Malabu forges connections between continental philosophy, empirical neuroscience, epigenetics, literature and psychoanalysis, among others. She has published widely and her work has been translated into several languages. Some of her recent publications translated into English are What Should We Do With Our Brain from 2009, Ontology of the Accident, an essay on destructive plasticity from 2012, Before Tomorrow, Epigenesis and Rationality from 2016, and Morphing Intelligence from IQ Measurement to Artificial Brains from 2019. Malabu lives in Paris. Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. I think okay. we're having a, a difficulty. I'll get back to you in a moment. Oh, no, we're... You hear me? You can continue, Catherine. Okay, so thank you. Um, so it, 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 it is, of course, difficult to uh, intervene just after Francoise, who gave us such a, an enlightening uh, paper. So, um, okay, but I'll do my best. So uh, I discovered uh, Kader Atia's work through his film, Reflections on Memory, that I watched with my Kingston students two years ago. I had done some work myself on phantom limbs and phantom pains before, while writing my book called The New Wounded, From Neurosis to Brain Damage, that came out in English in 2007. A book that set up a confrontation between the psychoanalytical and the contemporary neurological approach to trauma. So my, my presentation is structured uh, as followed in the first moment. In the first moment, I will uh, retrace how this book gradually led me to explore the issues of coloniality and decoloniality in a particular way. In the second moment, I will focus on the sub, subconscious and subliminal, uh, trying to give some definitions. And uh, in the last moment, I will show how the exploration of the subconscious resonates for me with the work of Fanon and also Sylvia Winter on psychoanalysis and its insufficiencies, insufficiencies that, to paraphrase Atia, has left repair in a state of fragmentation. So first of all, uh, what did I do on trauma in my book, The New Wounded? I decided to write this book when it appeared to me that the psychoanalytical concept of trauma elaborated by Freud and re-elaborated by Lacan, was not able to account for brain traumas. The word trauma in Greek derives from tetrosko, which means to pierce. Trauma thus designates the wound that results from an effraction, an effraction that can be physical, a patent wound, or psychical. In either case, trauma names a shock that forces open or pierces a protective barrier. For Freud, the trauma is the archetype of what he calls a psychic event. Now, what is the fundamental distinction between a psychic event understood in terms of psychoanalysis and a psychic event understood in terms of neurology? For Freud, a psychic event has always two sides, what he calls an exogenous, that is outside, and an endogenous inside side. For him, every event implies, on the one hand, an unexpected occurrence, an element of surprise. This is the, the exogenous aspect of the event. But another aspect, the endogenous aspect, that consists in the way in which this exteriority is always related by the, by the psyche to a pre-existent 
element in the history of the subject. The event for Freud is then conceived of as both an encounter that occurs from outside and an internal immanent determination uh, coming from the history of the subject. And we know that the German has two terms to designate the event, Ereignis, which is the event that comes from outside, and Erlebnis, the event that comes from inside. And sexuality in Freud is understood as the privileged site of an encounter between the outside and the inside, between the incident, the infraction, and its signification at the intersection between the nonsense of the surprise and the sense of the personal history of the subject. The course and regime of events governed by the brain is completely different. Brain damage is itself an event, of course, insofar as it affects the psychic identity of the subject, but it does not always, and perhaps never, relies on a connection between the exogenous and the endogenous. Therefore, no interpretation of it is possible. In the case of a brain lesion, for example, the external character of the accident remains, so to speak, external to the psyche itself. It remains exterior to the interior. Let's think of cerebral lesions or attacks, head trauma, tumors, encephalitis, degenerative brain diseases. These phenomena are constitutively inassimilable because they do not and cannot make any sense in the Freudian sense of the term, and yet they cannot be thought of as something else than authentic psychic event. It is not possible to understand neuronal disturbances in terms of pure and simple physiological lesions any longer. Such is one of the main reasons why they are so difficult to repair. The accidents of cerebrality are wounds that cut the thread of history, place the history of the subject outside itself, suspend its course, and remain hermeneutically irrecuperable as long as the psyche continues to live. The cerebral accident thus reveals the ability of the subject to survive the senselessness of its own accidents. It is precisely the psychic survival of the cerebral accident that Freud never accepted. One could even say that his elucidation of sexuality only became possible thanks to a neutralization of cerebrality. After his project for a scientific psychology, the brain will keep quickly become for him an organ merely exposed to damage from outside, incapable of treating the endogenous effects of inflowing excitation. For Freud, the, the brain is not the place where psychic events are constituted. And on, its, on this point, he will never waver. For him, in order for an accident to become properly a psychic event, it has to trigger the subject's psychic history and determinism. The most obvious example of such a definition of the psychic event is the example, often taken by him, of the war wound. When the soldier on the front gets traumatized by a wound or fear of the wound, it appears that the current real conflict is involved in is a repetition of an internal conflict, which most of the time for Freud is the Oedipal conflict. Challenging such a vision, I have called the new wounded people who suffer from psychic wounds that traditional psychoanalysis cannot understand, that is to say, consider as relevant to its jurisdiction. The new wounded are victims of accidental lesions or chronic illness. They suffer, no matter their disparate clinical profiles, from emotional disturbances that essentially consist in the more functioning of affective signals necessary to make decisions. To different degrees, they all display permanent or temporary behaviors of indifference or disaffection. And the new wounded are not merely those with brain lesions. We can consider as new wounded all those who are in a state of shock and who, without having suffered brain lesions proper, 
have still seen their neuronal organization and their psychic equilibrium altered by trauma. Such patients also suffer, in particular, from an emotional deficit. The behavior of subjects who are victims of trauma linked to mistreatment, war, terrorist attacks, captivity, or sexual abuse displays striking resemblances with subjects who have suffered brain damage. It is possible then to name these traumas socio-political traumas. And under this generic term, one should group all damage caused by extreme relational violence and today the border that separates organic trauma and socio-political trauma is increasingly porous. So now I move to my second uh, moment, second moment of this talk. It is a striking fact that many contemporary neurologists designate the site of psychic effects of cerebral and social traumas by using the old category of the subconscious. This category was, brought, was first brought to light by psychologists like Pierre Janet in France or Edward Myers in England in order to describe associations, automatisms, and impulses that are not accessible to consciousness. Freud used it a few times around 1890, but he later abandoned the term in favor of the unconscious, noting the following, I quote, if someone talks of subconsciousness, I cannot tell whether he means the term topographically to indicate something lying in the mind beneath consciousness or qualitatively to indicate another consciousness, a subterranean one, as it were. He's probably not clear about any of it. The only trustworthy antithesis is between conscious and unconscious. So clearly we see that for Freud, the term subconscious fails to differentiate whether content and the processing occurred in the unconscious or pre-conscious mind. That's why the term subconscious is never used in psychoanalytic writings. So clearly it is, I mean, it is obvious that the concept of subconscious very early disappeared from Western psychopathology and psychotherapy. And it still has today a negative content. When we think, for example, of uh, subliminal messages that are sent below the threshold of consciousness in order to influence it, we think of manipulation or paranormal phenomena. Uh, so how is it possible to explain the return of this term subconscious in contemporary neurobiology? There are several answers to this question, but one of the most important one precisely concerns the emotional response to trauma. It appears that brain patients who, for different reasons, can't make any connection between the outside and the inside, the ex exogenous and endogenous size of their wound, because they can't speak anymore, show emotional non-conscious reactions. In an article called The Neural Basis of the Dynamic Unconscious, Heather Berlin, who is a neurologist, declares that neurologists have further evidence of emotional processing without conscious awareness. Non-conscious stimuli can, in fact, elicit emotion states in brain lesion patients. In a phenomenon known as affective blindsight, patients with lesions in the primary visual cortex can have affective responses to emotional visual stimuli presented in their blind visual field without early cortical processing or conscious awareness. They deny consciously seeing anything in the blind field of the stimuli. Some patients with lesions can reliably discriminate the affective balance of facial expressions presented to their blind field by guessing or by using techniques like re reaction times despite having no conscious awareness of the stimuli. Blind sight and blind smell patients show modulation of amygdala activity in response to the emotional meaning of stimuli that they cannot see consciously. So there exists 
a non-aware uh, emotional reaction to trauma. So this phenomena prove that another locus of psychic traumatic inscription exists that the unconscious traditionally defined as the site of the symbolic, that is of language, memory, and trace, is not the only topography of shock and consequently also uh, of repair. I move now to the uh, third and last part of this talk. My research on the dissensus between psychoanalysis and neurobiology, between the unconscious and the subconscious, led me, as I said, to start with, to the post-colonial or rather decolonial issues. Not that, I'd paid, that I hadn't paid attention to it before, but it appeared because of this research in a different specific light. First, I discovered that the brain had always been considered a subaltern by European psychoanalysis and philosophy. A secondary colonized organ deprived of any symbolic dimension, a theoretical and political outsider. The subconscious has been rejected for the same reason, of course. And all these thoughts, uh, dealing with this kind of uh, colonialism of psychoanalysis over neurology, all these thoughts resonated with Fanon's analysis of the relationships between blackness and the unconscious. I found this sentence particularly significant in, of course, black skin and white masks. I, I quote, very often, the Negro who becomes abnormal has never bad relations with whites. Has some remote experience been repressed in his unconscious? Did the little black child see his father beaten or lynched by a white man? Has there been a real traumatism to all of this? We have to answer no. So Fanon says that it is as if uh, for the black person, there was no place for a specific trauma from the point of view of traditional and classical psychoanalysis. So it is clear that he's um, trying to bring to light the necessity of a specific space uh, for the black trauma, so to speak, to get inscribed. So the main question that Fanon raises is to know where shock, pain, trauma can get inscribed, written in the black subject psyche to the extent that their unconscious is, as he says, white, and that the idea of individual psychological pathology is the result of mere colonialism. I cannot but see resemblances between the neurology of the subconscious and this new science that Fanon calls sociogeny. I quote this famous uh, passage. Besides, he says, besides phylogeny and ontogeny, there is sociogeny. So this is a new science that is uh, uh, hoping to uh, ground. It is not psychoanalysis. It is not sociology, it is not biology, it is psychoanalysis, sociology, biology, but seen through the lenses uh, of the incapacity to locate what black trauma can be. It is a science that would study how the crossing between the biological, the cultural, and the psychical is fashioning black identity and self-representation in a certain way that Freud had no idea of. The issue is to find a way, he says, to liberate black people from their white unconscious, a quote in French, nous, de, nous ne tenons rien de moins qu'à libérer l'homme de couleur de lui-même, but to, to, to emancipate uh, the black man from himself, which implies a new psychic topography of repair. How does Sylvia Winter, the black Jamaican writer, how does she read this call from, uh, for the foundation of sociogeny? She has a very interesting article called Towards the Sociogenic Principle, Fanon, the Puzzle of Conscious Experience of Identity and what, it, what, what it's like to be black. So I, I, I say again, the title of the article, 
towards the sociogenic principle, Fanon, the puzzle of conscious experience of identity and what it's like to be black. And in this article, she affirms that such a topography of repair for the black psyche should rely on the strong link that exists between consciousness and the brain, and that's why it is so interesting for me, and also between consciousness and subconsciousness. I quote, she says, Fanon's sociogenic conception of the human, one generated from the ground of his own, as well as, that is, that of his fellow French Caribbean subject, lived experience of being black, of what it is like to be black, also opens a frontier onto the solution to the problem defined by David Chalmers as that of the puzzle of conscious experience. The puzzle, both as to how a subjective experience could possibly arise from the neural processes in the brain. So I think this is very interesting because it is very seldom to see in a decolonial text an association between uh, the experience of black identity and the brain, because usually uh, critical theorists fear that the reference to biology might be just reductive and might open to a mere uh, biologism. And this, well, Winter is not at all going in that direction, but she wants to affirm, and, and I think this is very um, striking, she wants to affirm that uh, because it is repressed, the black identity, I mean, the trauma of black identity is linked uh, with some subconscious neural processes in the brain. So what does she mean by subconscious? Something that cannot be reduced to awareness, of course. Uh, it is linked with what Du Bois Called, we know that the double consciousness, the phenomenon of double consciousness. In Dubois, double consciousness designates the split between the self that identifies itself with the white self and the self who knows itself as dominated. And Winter reinterprets this double consciousness as the split between consciousness on the white hand, on, on, the, on one hand, sorry, like the identification of black identity with whiteness, and of course, the subconscious resistance to this identification. Subconscious because uh, there is no unconscious uh, for the reasons we already exposed. Uh, the unconscious as Freud defines it, cannot uh, grant any space to this uh, uh, trend to resist the assimilation to whiteness. So the subliminal space or the subconscious space for Winter is the, is the site of where the fragmentation of the self due to the contradiction with the dominant position is inscribed and elaborated. This contradiction might coincide with the one that exists in psychology between what is called the body image and the body schema. By body image, psychologists designate the body understood as the intentional object of one's consciousness. In this case, the representation of the body is the content of one's consciousness. This has been first stated by Head and Holmes in 1912. But the body schema, uh, on the contrary, is considered a subconscious awareness of the body or a subconscious paradoxical consciousness of the body that is uh, the extra intentional, subconscious, subpersonal, unknown uh, feeling, let's say, of the body proper. I think interesting to modify such traditional definitions of uh, the body image and the body schema that don't take the political and particularly the colonial phenomenon into account so that they can integrate the dimension of what Fanon calls the sociogeny, that is the dimension of sociogenic traumas. I would like to insist in conclusion upon the fact that such a dimension, I mean the political dimension 
uh, of sociogenic trauma is also traumatopoietic. As we know, since the emergence of surrealism and surrealist poetry, the subconscious has been considered the resource of automatic writing, a reservoir of images and types that can never become aware and at the same time are precursors of this political temporality called the surreal, a real that has become indistinguishable from poetry. Automatic writing signals a desire to explore the fundamentally ghostly experience of opening oneself up to whatever might be hidden within the psyche, intentionally putting oneself into a trance state in order to access otherwise repressed thoughts, words, and images buried in the subconscious. I wonder if a new grammar of surrealism, a language that would take into account the poetic potential of the trauma, as well as its political balance, as I tried to define it, might not be invented as a means to repair the pathological dimension of trauma. This new grammar of surrealism would require a secret dialogue between the brain, the imagination, political identity, and subliminal ghosts. It seems to me that Kader Atia's work opened vistas onto such a project, and we saw that when he talked about dreams a moment ago in his presentations. It, presentation. It seems seemed to me that Atia also uh, brought to light the necessity of elaborating a grammar of resistance from an, not, a, not an unconscious precisely, but a subconscious point of view. So let me quote Fanon one last time before I stop. Fanon says, I quote, in the world I am heading, in the world I'm heading for, I am endlessly creating myself. Thank you very much for your attention. Catherine, thank you so very much for your contribution. Uh, I could see in the QA, the QA section, section the questions, questions, are questions are accumulating. And we're very much we're looking very much forward, forward to, to have you back uh, for the conversation later. And for uh, uh, all of uh, uh, you who join us, we will resume again 10 minutes past 4 o'clock. Thank you.
All right, welcome back. We'll come back to uh, the gathering number one of Fragments of Repair, opening gathering of this multi-part project convened by Buck, Basis for Actuelle Kunst in uh, collaboration with um, uh, La Colonie in Paris and of course together with Artis Caderatia. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our uh, next speaker, Achille Membe, and his lecture titled Repair of, Re Repair of Reason from this particular fragment of, uh, of the exhibition and that's uh, a work from 2020 titled The Objects Interlacing. I'd like to read from the, from the guidebook uh, as, uh, by means of introduction, um, a couple of notes about this particular work. In the video within this installation, a variety of practitioners engage with the complex subject of the restitution of African culture artifacts that were violently displaced into Western ownership during the era of historical colonialisms. Considered from various contemporary perspectives, philosophical, legal, anthropological, psychoanalytical, and economic, as well as from the view viewpoint of collecting a mu museology, the assembly of voices unfolds an understanding of restitution as a practice of repair that reaches far beyond a simple returning of plundered objects to their place of origin. Now, the protagonists decry the looting colonial machine as well as its tragic disregard for the local cosmology of life that the stolen objects signify. Within such a cosmology, the objects are the living and acting force and a fundamental symbolic, philosophical and discursive resource sustaining its people as a society. The West appropriated them not for these um, cultural, social and religious meanings, but of course for their material and market worth, thus emptying them of spiritual charge, soul and secrets. Yet having been kept from their natural function and native habitat, over time the artifacts themselves have, quote unquote, internalized their new roles, absorbing in particular their characterization as aesthetic or ethnographic objects. Accumulating these manifold hybrid identities, they underwent fundamental mutation as did the populations where they once belonged so clearly. And I quote, when you talk about the return of objects, one protagonist asks, where are they going to return to? Do they return merely as goods or are the immaterial qualities they once held reclaimable? And if they are irreparable, can this irreparable repair become a source of creative reinvention in spite of persisting colonial asymmetries? As this intricate discourse around these questions unfolds throughout the video, it is beamed through a field populated with replicas of artifacts of non-Western provenance, some made as traditional wood carvings and others as high-tech 3D printed sculptures. The objects cast their silhouettes onto a screen to performatively reclaim their own voice in this conversation. Superimposing their immaterial presence onto the footage, they seem to attest that the spiritual exists in excess of the material and thus cannot be owned. Yet in the elaborate shadow play they initiate, one can also sense a proposition for a decolonial epistemology that recognizes this interlacing of both the historicity and the legitimacy of the object with their journey and translocation. And this brings me to the lecture by Ashil Membe. Thank you for joining us, Repair of reason. Achille um, is a philosopher, political scientist and critical thinker. Uh, he's professor at the Wits Institute for Social and Economic Research at the University of the Witwatersrand, Johannesburg. He has worked uh, as a visiting professor at several universities, including University of California, Berkeley, Yale University, Connecticut, uh, Connecticut University of California, Irvine, Duke University, North Carolina, and Harvard University, Massachusetts. Member has received several awards for his work, including the Geschwister Scholl Prize in 2015, the uh, Gerda Henkel uh, Award in 2018, and the Ernst Bloch uh, Award in 2018. A co-founder of Les Ateliers de la Pensée, a Dakar, and a major figure in the emergence of a new wave of French critical theory, he has written extensively on contemporary politics and philosophy, including on the post-colony, 
21, Critique of Black Reason, 2016, Necropolitics, 2019, and Out of the Dark Night, Essays of Decolonization from last year, 2020. Originally written in French, his books and numerous articles have been translated into more than a dozen languages. Member works and lives in Johannesburg. Thank you again for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you. trying to um, uh, awaken us to the um, urgency, I would say, of uh, rethinking um, all that comes under the name of repair, reparation, restitution, uh, restoration, uh, reconstruction, uh, and so forth and so on, by which I mean, um, oh, beginning anew. What I'm going to do, I mean, I'm not going to give a, a lecture, uh, although I prepared a lecture, but uh, uh, it's getting a bit late during the day, and I'm not sure that that's the best way to to um, to keep our attention focused on uh, what Kader and, and you would like us to uh, think about. So what I'm going to do is to to think aloud, uh, to think uh, tentatively. Uh, so none of what I'm going to say is definitive. It's all entirely uh, provisional, uh, if you want. Um, but but it seems to me that uh, um, that uh, connection between provisionality and repair uh, is clearly something. Uh, we need to uh, to look uh, uh, seriously uh, into uh, because if the concept of repair uh, suggests anything, uh, I think it has to do with the uh, the the provisionality of of things. Um, things are are subjected to uh, operations of repair precisely because uh, they are provisional because um, they do not uh, enjoy that kind of duration that is limitless. And that the duration comes to an end at some point, they are broken at some point, and they need to, to recover uh, uh, their integrity. So that element of provisionality, which is uh, not exactly the same thing as fragility or vulnerability, but it has something to do with it. I think it uh, has to be part of our way of thinking about repair, a mode of thinking about repair, which in and of itself uh, calls for repair because it is provisional. So that's the spirit uh, of the uh, uh, loud thinking uh, I'm going to engage in. Now, uh, this way of thinking will really be uh, um, made of, uh, let's say, a set, set of remarks. So let me start with um, one basic remark, which observation, which has to do with uh, the um, obvious fact that uh, we we live today in in a world which is to a large extent computational. That wasn't the case uh, yesterday. Yesterday meaning, let's say, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Um, we couldn't characterize our world as a, a computational world. But we can do that uh, today. A computational world uh, in which we are now, I would say, fully implicated, uh, fully. Of course, uh, some are more implicated in it than others. And um, uh, various forms of uh, uh, inequalities, in fact, uh, are nowadays uh, structured, built into, into computation. 
which wasn't the case yesterday. But in any case, uh, broadly speaking, uh, the world we are now implicated in is computational. It is uh, um, it also has as a, a fundamental characteristic the fact of being planetary. Uh, it's not European uh, only, it's not African only, it's not American only or Asian only, it is planetary. So uh, computer, the computational and the planetary um, are coming together uh, in ways uh, which uh, com uh, substantially transfigure uh, our experience of existence. Uh, it doesn't really matter where we are, but our uh, existential condition nowadays is to a large extent uh, uh, shaped by uh, those uh, forces, computational forces, and uh, planetary forces. So that's the first characteristic of that world, planetarity. Um, underlying that computational world is um, a dream, and I call it a dream because that's what it is, the dream that uh, when that world, computational world is, is, um, is um, how to say it, uh, completely um, achieved, um, there won't be any need for, for repair any longer. In fact, that is the, uh, the utopia behind the computational world, that the computational world might open up an era of our life on Earth when we don't need to repair anything any longer. Reparation won't be necessary. It won't be necessary. Uh, it will be replaced by replacement. As something becomes obsolete, uh, we simply replace it. We don't repair it. We'll come to uh, the end of the need uh, or for, for repair. That is the, um, I would say, the, uh, the fiction. Um, I call it a fiction because in fact, um, it's, um, it's a world that will not abolish risk. Um, it will not abolish calamity. Uh, in fact, it will generate calamities of, of its own. Uh, some of those calamities will uh, come uh, straight from the bowels of the earth. Uh, others will come from the seas, the oceans, uh, which uh, bowels of the earth and uh, the seas, which we have never ceased from uh, boring, we haven't ceased from uh, splitting, we haven't ceased from sapping. And uh, yet other calamities will be, I would say, the, um, the direct consequence of um, our ecocidal relationships with other species, especially um, the animal and the organic world. So uh, whatever the case, uh, these calamities will uh, put our existence on the planet into play every single time. Uh, each, of course, uh, uh, in its own own way. Uh, some will be local, uh, but most will have um, what I would call a coefficient of universal expansion. And, and in this sense, uh, there will no no borders. The paradox, however, because there is a paradox, the paradox is that uh, the less effective our borders will be uh, in protecting us from these uh, scourges, the more irrepressible our desire will be for them. 
And we are already in any case in that uh, paradigm where uh, the desire for borders has never been as acute as it is today. Uh, desire for borders uh, in the hope that uh, borders will not only uh, save us from uh, calamities, either of our own or calamities coming from, from outside, but also in the hope that uh, with borders, uh, we won't face the need to, to repair, we won't face the need to restitute, we won't face the need to, to repair. So that's the first set of comments uh, I wanted to make in relation to, let's say, the, uh, the conundrum of, of uh, reparation, of repairing, uh, and of reason uh, in, in, an, in a computational age, if you, if you want. But let me now move to uh, a second uh, observation, which is not uh, unrelated to, to the first, uh, and which has to do with the, uh, the present day belief, belief that uh, humanity, uh, or at least a, a portion of it, uh, will survive by uh, moving on to uh, another stage of uh, biological evolution. And a uh, uh, new stage of uh, acquiring uh, an artificial nervous system. Uh, the belief that uh, humanity will move to an entirely different stage of its biological evolution uh, by uh, emigrating uh, to um, some exoplanet. Uh, so that belief is there. It's part of the key beliefs, fundamental beliefs of, of our times. And so the, the myth of uh, cosmic uh, transplantation is back. It has been there before. There was a moment when it receded, but is now uh, fully back with us. Uh, the, um, the, this idea that, uh, in fact, we could exit the earth. We could leave this earth behind us. Uh, this earth which has been so damaged and which is uh, in so much need of repair indeed, that rather than uh, engaging in the uh, colossal labor of repairing it, maybe we could just simply exit it um, and, and, and thus avoid that uh, colossal labor of repair and, and uh, uh, settle somewhere else, settle a new uh, somewhere else uh, in some exoplanet. And if one looks at the, the power politics of, uh, of great nations today, um, it is uh, partially uh, underpinned, I would argue, uh, by the dream uh, of uh, some kind of automated organization of the world, um, thanks to uh, the manufacture of uh, a new subject, a new subject that would be at once uh, a physiological assemblage, a synthetic an electronic assemblage and a neurobiological assemblage. So three different sorts of uh, uh, bringing together of, of matter that would uh, result in the uh, creation in some kind of uh, second creation. And uh, you know that the first, at least if we follow the biblical myth, the first creation was of course the creation of a subject uh, drawn from from the earth itself, from dust, uh, if, if you want. But in this kind of second creation, the matter, the the, the foundational matter wouldn't be dust as such. Uh, it would be a, a set of assemblages, uh, both uh, synthetic, uh, electronic, uh, neurobiological, and so forth and so on. Um, so this is what, of course, we, we could call techno-libertarianism. Uh, techno-libertarianism 
is not unique to, to the West. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, China has also embraced it uh, vertiginously so. But whether in China or in the West, uh, the, uh, the aim is to, to bring to an end the task of the project of repair. That, there's a, that we won't have to repair anything that we destroy. We would just have to replace it. Uh, so the substitution of replacement by, let's say, of repair by replacement. I, I highlight uh, these um, fictions, uh, utopias, because they have a, a very deep hold in our contemporary imagination. Um, that, that Kader is asking us to rethink repair at a time when, as I'm trying to show, uh, many want to, to get rid of it, uh, make sure that they, we, 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 we move to a historical phase of our inhabitation of the earth where that is no longer, in fact, uh, needed, and therefore we can destroy at will. Uh, so that's the second, second remark. Uh, the third, and then I will try to begin to draw, let's see, the consequences of uh, these wild thoughts, because uh, that's, that's what they, they really are, and I intend them to, to be that way. At the same time, it seems to me that uh, when we look carefully at uh, what's going on in our world today, um, our computational world, it seems to me that some Another paradigm of, of government uh, is, is gradually taking hold. Um, it's not, uh, let's say, the biopolitical paradigm that has dominated so much of our thinking, especially since Foucault came up with that concept. Uh, it's only partly that. It's only partly the necropolitical paradigm that some of us have uh, pushed forward, especially since the, uh, the early 2000s, uh, trying to bring into focus, let's say, long histories of uh, damage, uh, which precede the contemporary period, uh, which we can, of course, uh, uh, extend to as far back as, uh, as we want. But that part of what is emerging is something we could call government by capture. Either government by capture or uh, government by continuous annexation of life flows. Uh, this form of government, uh, as far as one can see, is the work of entirely new forms of power uh, forms of power, I would call mutant powers. Now, uh, the paradigm of uh, government by capture or government by mutant powers um, uh, in relation uh, to which uh, history and speech are virtually uh, non-existent comes up this government by capture and by mutant powers, it comes up against the reality of, uh, of bodies of flesh, bodies of, of bone, bodies of microbes, bodies of viruses, bacteria, all sorts of, of fluids, including blood itself. It comes up, if you want, against the uh, reality of a history that can only be read and interpreted today on the scale of mineralogical, climatological, and geological time. That the concept of time itself has mutated. It's no longer just the past, the present, the future. As Dipesh Chakrabarti and others have been 
telling us it's a different, let's say, calculus of time that draws from the re reality that is not simply bodily, as I have described it uh, an instant ago, but that is also mineralogi mineralogical, that is geological, um, and that is partly uh, cosmic, uh, the cosmic temporal scale of the universe. So time has exploded, if you want, that uh, part of what the computational does is that it leaves time itself, it breaks it into, into pieces. It, it, it unleashes a process of implosion of time. Uh, so, so, that, so far so that time is now to be found uh, in uh, a number of instances we were not used to look for it. We didn't used to look for it in the histories of, of climate, for instance. We didn't used to look for it in uh, the deep histories of minerals. Uh, but nowadays, to account for our condition, planetary and computational and viral, for that matter, uh, we have to uh, look into these new areas, uh, which complicates uh, very much, let's say, the task of, of repair. We repair from on the basis of what kind of time, what, what, what temporal bedrock, uh, if you want. Hi, Thomas. You wanted to, were you speaking to me? No, okay, okay. So, so that's, um, let's say, uh, um, a set of uh, observations, third uh, range of observations which for me complicates uh, quite singularly, um, let's see what uh, Kader is asking us uh, to do. It doesn't mean that this is not doable. What, what uh, that Kader's project is not, uh, uh, it's just, uh, uh, no, it, it can be done. It can be done, but we, then we need to, to, to look into different kinds of archives, if you want. Uh, that the decolonial gesture is um, uh, uh, asking us to, to make, uh, in order to, to do it, accomplish that uh, decolonial gesture, it is uh, absolutely important to pay serious attention to the, the question of the archive. Now, uh, I have been, um, over the last few years, I have been uh, going back to, let's say, uh, what we could call African pre-colonial archives. Um, not because these are stable archives, archives are always, by definition, contested. Um, not because there is some treasure there that one would find uh, which is intact and then we would fast forward it to the time of the now which is totally different from the pre-colonial times. No, I don't believe in that. I've been looking into it because there are elements in that archive that um, can inspire us um, help us in, in our attempt at uh, forging uh, other, other maps of the world, other maps of thinking too, other forms of image thought, image pensée, other ways of uh, framing uh, the key questions of our time. And African pre archives are really interesting because it's partly because, as we know, I mean, Africa is the uh, oldest child of humanity. Um, and Africa is one of the oldest residents of the earth. And, and this means something. It means something to have been there almost all along, to have been there uh, before, uh, if you want, uh, 
everyone else. And uh, Africa is interesting because when we, we look into, into what, what it is the sign of, it is the sign of two things. It is the sign, it is once, at once, I would say, a power in reserve, uh, in puissance en reserve, and a reserve of power, et une réserve de puissance. The two terms maybe make more sense in English than, sorry, in French, than in English. In French, uh, une puissance en réserve and une réserve de puissance. It is both. Now we'll need a, a good translator to, to put them, these two terms properly uh, in, in English. Now, when I say uh, a power in reserve or reserve of power, by power, I refer, of course, not to the uh, incessant movement of, of destruction or destruction of beings and of things, without which we wouldn't be talking about repair. Talk about repair because something has been broken up, because something has been destroyed. So there's that kind of power power of destruction, of beings, of things. But there's also power understood in particular in these African pre-colonial archive, power understood as a vital force. Um, power understood as um, a potential of uh, originality, um, as a, a flow of, of energy and uh, if you want a uh, unique capacity for, for resonance, for resilience, and for creativity. Is that kind of concept of power uh, I, I'm uh, talking uh, about. And in fact, as we can see uh, in its um, ancient archives, um, dispensing with the power of destruction and embracing this other form of power I have been uh, referring to has been a, a key uh, uh, element in uh, African uh, concepts of, uh, of the world. And the world being what? The, let's say the, uh, the, uh, the, the world, the act of inhabiting the world, inhabiting the earth, having to do with the capacity to forge alliances with other vital forces, uh, because this is understood to be the, uh, the surest means of participating in the realization of, of the cosmos, uh, uh, which is to say, participating in the construction of a dwelling place that makes room for everyone. And um, uh, uh, a dwelling place where, uh, if you want, uh, everyone is called upon to become uh, potential ancestors, uh, to become segments in an uninterrupted chain of links. So that question of relationality is absolutely crucial therefore in in um, in philosophies of of repair and of uh, reparation making room to everyone and uh, creating a space for everyone to become a potential ancestor uh, becomes absolutely crucial in imagining what uh, uh, life is uh, all about. I could go on and on on that, uh, but let me leave it at that and end my comments with a few observations on reason, how we repair reason itself. Why is it that what we have to really face today is a task of repairing of reason uh, itself? But let me preface uh, my remarks on repairing reason um, with two things. 
two reminders. The first is, of course, that reason is, is a, a faculty which uh, we use to, to recognize in humans and in humans alone. At least uh, such was the case in the so-called uh, Western tradition of which, uh, as it happens, we have all inherited, whether we like it or not. Now, in that tradition, reason was uh, always seen as the highest of all human faculties. Um, the highest in the sense that it was the one uh, that opened the doors uh, to knowledge, uh, to wisdom, to virtue, and uh, most importantly, to freedom. That's why um, most emancipatory ideologies in these uh, Western, his in Western history are premised on the cultivation of, of reason. Of course, uh, it was at some point understood that reason was unequally redistributed. I mean, when you read not only Hegel, I mean, uh, all that tradition, Kant and everybody else, uh, reason was the faculty uh, not of every uh, single being, uh, but of white men uh, in particular. Then it was extended to uh, white women uh, and and uh, etc. Cetera, uh, et cetera. So, um, uh, whatever the case, it was uh, um, a human prerogative alone. Uh, it distinguished uh, humans from other living species, and thanks to their superior capacity to exercise this faculty, uh, humans, it was thought, uh, could claim to be exceptional. But as we know, the history of reason has been far from straightforward. Um, in the name of reason, uh, humanity has been a constant sometimes blind force uh, in the history of the living world uh, in its attempt to achieve uh, its project of universal domination uh, once and for all, uh, humankind has uh, uh, imagined that uh, uh, all it had to do was to, to harness the force of matter uh, the force of water, wind, metals, fuels, radioactive materials. Uh, and the belief has been that salvation on Earth, uh, if it were to be achieved, it would be achieved through the machine. And the machine has become, therefore, the uh, embodiment of, of reason. You know that, that story. I mean, it has been the object of critique, uh, both internally to the West and uh, uh, from other parts of, of the world. The point I really want to make is that today, reason is on trial. What strikes me is the extent to which this faculty is nowadays on trial. It is on trial in two ways. First, reason is increasingly replaced and subsumed by instrumental rationality. When it is not simply reduced to procedural or algorithmic processing of information. In an age when knowledge itself is uh, taken to, let's say, is reduced to information. So that's the first um, way in which reason is on trial uh, in the sense that the logic of reason is morphing from within machines and computers and algorithms. It is on trial in the sense that 
the human brain is no longer the privileged location of reason. The human brain is being downloaded into nanomachines. And as a result, of course, an inordinate amount of power is gradually being ceded to abstractions of all kinds. In the sense that uh, old models of, of reasoning are being challenged by new ones, uh, new ones that originate uh, through and within technology in general, and digital technologies uh, in particular, uh, as well as uh, through, let's say, the, uh, the top-down models of artificial uh, intelligence. And as a result, techne, techne is becoming the quintessential language of reason. So reason is under siege as a result of the processes I have just uh, described, let's say, uh, uh, briefly. Furthermore, instrumental reason, or reason in the guise of technique, is increasingly weaponized. It is weaponized at a moment when time itself is more and more enveloped in the doings of machines. While machines themselves do not simply execute instructions or programs, they start generating complex behavior. So what I want to say is that the, the computational reproduction of reason has made it such that reason is no longer or is a bit more than just the domain of the human species. We now share it with various other agents. While what we understand to be reality is uh, itself increasingly construed uh, via statistics, uh, metadata, uh, modeling, mathematics, and so forth, and so on. So that's one big chunk of what is going on. The other big chunk has to do, I think, with the fact that many people are increasingly turning their back on reason in favor of uh, other faculties or other modes of expression and cognition. They are calling, for instance, for a rehabilitation of affect, of emotions, uh, in, in many, in fact, of the ongoing political struggles of our times, uh, passion is uh, clearly trumping reason. And confronted with complex issues, uh, feeling and acting with one's guts uh, viscerally uh, rather than reasoning is fast becoming the new norm. So uh, what I have just said shows you the extent to which reason is on trial. But even more importantly, reason is on trial at the very moment when we are increasingly surrounded by multiple and expanding wave fronts of calculation. And more and more, these wave fronts incorporate life itself and matter into systems of abstractions and machinic uh, reasoning, in the process, they generate new automated couplings, couplings between matter and machines, waste and human beings. And if yesterday the modern uh, rational subjects raison de vivre was to fight myth, to fight superstitions, and obscurantism, the work of reason nowadays is to allow for different modes of, of seeing 
and, and measuring uh, to appear, I would say. So repairing reason becomes absolutely crucial in this sense. It becomes crucial if we are to fight against obscurantism and tyranny, because the two go together. And if we are to um, re-engineer um, the uh, task of freedom, uh, which originally was, uh, uh, we thought was, was premised on, on, on reason. Um, we can only do it today if indeed we are able to identify the thresholds which distinguish between the calculable and the incalculable. The thresholds which allow us to distinguish between the quantifiable and the unquantifiable, the computable and the incomputable. I say this because technologies of calculation, of computation and quantification present us with one world among many actual and possible worlds. Um, we can repair reason if we are able to understand that there are different modes of measuring and that different modes of measuring will open up the possibility of different aesthetics, uh, of different politics of inhabiting, uh, not just the earth, but the universe, will open up different possibilities of sharing the planet. And in sharing the planet, um, to, let's say, unleash new modalities of uh, um, understanding what life is all about uh, at a moment when uh, we are surrounded, I would say, by multiple wave fronts of uh, calculation. So repairing reason is absolutely uh, crucial if the logic of secular causality at work in contemporary technology and politics and that logic is to be to be broken uh, broken up. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so very much, Ashil. Thank you. Um, while we get all contributors back uh, on the screen to join the conversation, I would like to introduce uh, Sven Luteken. Uh, who will moderate a conversation with Skade Atia, Françoise Verger, Catherine Malabou and uh, Achille Membe. Sven is an art historian, uh, a critic and editor and senior research advisor here at Buck. Um, he teaches at uh, Freie Universiteit in Amsterdam and uh, the Dutch Art Institute in Arnhem. Uh, Sven has written extensively on the central role of historical theory in contemporary art and media. He's a regular contributor to international journals and art magazines such as New Left Review, Textetzurkunst, Grey Room, Eflux Journal, and After All. Publications include Deserting from the Culture Wars from 2020, Culture Revolution, Aesthetic Practice After Autonomy 2016, History in Motion, Time in the Age of the Moving Image 2013, Idols of the Market, uh, Modern Iconoclasm, and The Fundamentalist Spectacle 2009, and Secret Publicity, Essays on Contemporary Art, 2006. He curated exhibitions uh, which include The Strange Case of the Case at the Dutch Art Institute in Arnhem 2017, The Art of Iconoclasm at Buck in 20, 2009, and Lie Once More Forms of Reenactment in Contemporary Art at Witte de Witt uh, in Rotterdam in uh, 2005. Sven lives and works here in Utrecht. I think we do have the speakers back with us and uh, Sven, please take it away. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Uh, am I uh, audible, Thomas and Co? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, 
just on a personal note, I was fortunate enough, uh, I was fortunate enough to be at La Colonie a couple of times, and uh, it gives me a form of phantom pain, actually, to think that it's no longer there. Um, it's quite unimaginable, unimaginable in a way, but here we are with uh, La Colonie Nomade, picking up the pieces and uh, putting them back together, perhaps in new constellations. Of course, picking up um, the pieces of all of today's rich contributions isn't easy and is, in fact, impossible. Um, but I think there are many uh, resonances and there was a, a, a strong focus, I think, on, let's say, a certain dialectic of continuity and transformation. So on the one hand, there was this attentiveness to the, the deep time or the, the long durée of, uh, of colonialism uh, and exploitation and exhaustion. exhaustion. And on the other hand, uh, there was this attentiveness certainly also to uh, recent... Uh, recent transformations um, in these uh, ongoing histories. Okay, I'm getting a slightly disconcerting echo, which is getting worse, actually. Um, okay, now it's gone, good. So, yeah, if we begin to uh, perhaps draw out some of these uh, resonances, um, kind of going from the very beginning, from Kader's introduction to... Um, Achille's talk at the end, um, Kader mentioned the 24-7 colonization of our, of our minds and of our brains through algorithmic governance. Of course, there are also resonances here with um, Catherine's talk, but then I was really struck also by um, Achille's um, delineation of this utopian dream, this techno-libertarian dream, uh, which is the replacement of repair uh, pardon me, which is the replacement of repair with replacement, including the replacement of this planet, ultimately, right? Leaving uh, the Earth uh, behind as a, as a kind of um, uh, burnt out uh, sort of wreck, basically. Uh, so the, the utopian, uh, dystopian utopian uh, replacement of repair with replacement, which... Uh, raises all kinds of issues, which generates uh, uh, complications for the task of repair that we actually want to uh, pursue in a kind of anti-utopian or alter-utopian uh, project. Um, this then requires this um, critique of reason or also a repair of reason. Uh, but as um, Achille has also emphasized, actually reason today, which has so long acted as a blind force, uh, reason is on trial, reason is under siege, uh, precisely by its uh, transformation into instrumental reason and then its transformation into um, kind of algorithmic uh, rationality, um, computational reason. And perhaps to get us started, uh, a first question that I want to uh, ask uh, Achille, but of course also the others can uh, chip in and hopefully it will become a discussion. You, since you mentioned you, you evoked basically a fairly uh, um, canonical form of the, the imminent critique of reason with Adorno and Horkheimer, you used the term of instrumental rationality. Uh, my question to you would be whether you can um, perhaps elaborate a little bit on the difference in the repetition if we again have this need, this urgent need at the moment to... Uh, engage with this instrumental rationality and with its sort of successor in the form of computational reason. Um, how and, um, yeah, why and how um, does this go beyond or can we actually go out of, get out of this loop? Can we get out of this loop in which we continue sort of to be the faithful, loyal, imminent critics of reason? Um, how can we indeed um, transmutate this um, kind of critique of reason or perhaps a repair of reason as distinct from this kind of critique of reason into tools for resistance? Uh, You're asking me to answer. <laughs> I'm asking you not to give us the definitive answer, of course, but perhaps you could riff a little bit uh, on this and um, give us a few thoughts and pointers, perhaps. Look, I mean, I only had a little bit of time, so mm. I couldn't really go yes. into the uh, nitty-gritty. 
yes. of the, uh, my, my argument. Um, of course, we, we have inherited a, a certain kind of critique of reason, uh, which uh, um, uh, emanates from uh, within uh, so-called Western tradition itself. Uh, the, the concept of reason, uh, if anything, has been the object of uh, a constant um, critique within, uh, within the West, whether that this critique is coming from, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, let's see, uh, you mentioned uh, Adorno, Horkheimer, the eclipse of reason, or, or early on uh, uh, from other uh, intellectual traditions. There's also a critique of reason that has been uh, leveled by, um, let's say, let's say outside of that tradition. Um, to, to, to put it uh, briefly, uh, by uh, uh, a whole uh, uh, heritage of, of thought, uh, which nowadays is called decolonial, uh, uh, those who have been colonized precisely uh, in, in the name of, uh, of reason. So, so they are, uh, what I, I mean is that there is a, a, a plural archive there that allows us to, um, to, to, uh, to build uh, on um, uh, various traditions that have uh, articulated critique of reason at different uh, periods of, uh, of modern history. What I was suggesting is that um, we, what we are facing uh, right now, um, um, let's say, requires probably um, a, a, new, a new cycle of, uh, uh, of, of critique. Um, what we are facing, I tried to uh, describe briefly the, uh, the morphing uh, uh, of reason into technique uh, in a context in which um, knowledge itself is increasingly uh, uh, reduced to information um, on the one hand, or uh, is um, identified purely and simply as uh, experience, uh, a privatized kind of experience, um, um, which belongs to, uh, to me, um, which allows me to know things no one else uh, knows unless that other undergoes uh, precisely the same experience. So kind of uh, uh, visceral uh, type of uh, experience, which is, which is um, uh, hardly shareable, which cannot be shared. Uh, so so uh, singular uh, it is. Um, which defeats, uh, as a matter of fact, the very uh, project of reason, which is that, I mean, on its basis, a lot of things can be shared, or, 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 or if only uh, uh, they can be understood, this space for empathy, uh, 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 and so forth and so on. So all of that, uh, uh, we are told, is no longer really a case. So uh, what I was trying to do is to suggest that we, we are facing an entirely uh, new moment when we can, uh, building on what we have received, uh, articulate a different uh, critique of reason, and, and in so doing, uh, maybe imagine different modes of, of repairing it. But as I told you at the beginning, I mean, uh, I was thinking loudly, uh, prompted by, by, on the one hand, Kader, and on the other, uh, Francoise, of course, who with whom personally I have been, uh, uh, she has been for asking me for a long time to pay attention to these, uh, these kinds of issues. Uh, but I'm not sure that I, I, I mean, uh, no, I think I, I was just sharing some intuitions. Yes, no, thank you. That was, that was clear and that was very uh, helpful and productive. I think that's very much what we're uh, doing here. Um, is there anybody who would 
like to um, like to respond, build on that comment. Yeah, Kader. Can I can I say something? Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you, uh, thanks to all the participants and and Achille for your last contribution. Mm -hmm. But I have to say yeah. that yeah. in terms of, um, 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 I mean. Um, trying, as you said, to invent, uh, I would definitely call them the colonial strategy uh, in, in front of the uh, algorithmic governance that we are witnessing today. And uh, mm -hmm. the question of the media and temporality of time is extremely important because from what I have experimented with the students the last 20 years is that we, we are actually from a generation where learning was much more synonym of taking time, of deepening researches. You come up with, with, with students who know a lot, but have been like talking about fragment of Reaper, informing del themselves through a speed, the media speed of today, but not superficially, I'm not saying it's superficial, but I'm saying that it's another, it's a, it's a picky, uh, uh, way of learning. And that's why I think the crucial question is to relearn to learn. This is something I, I wanted to tell you. Why, why I'm saying this? Because I think the core, sta the core task will be to care about the capacity that individuals have to preserve their autonomy of judgment and of reflection. In a uh, where, I mean, the economy of exhaustion, as Francoise uh, brought it very, very interestingly, has also to do with mental health, has also to do because of this relation we do have today with this algorithmic governance is, is, hmm. is definitely toxic at the co cognitive level. And then is, it affects mental health resources. I think it's extremely important to also uh, question the fact that, and everyone knows here, that consciousness is a flux of time. I mean, it's not stable. It's a relation with time. We do have, as you said, Hashil, we do live a crisis of consciousness, of uh, reason, sorry. But at the same time, I really think that there are, of course, different layers to approach this, uh, I mean, uh, to propose form of repair. And I think one of them, again, is is really like to to, to understand that we, um, we need to, to really care about the, 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 the way of learning and, and to reinvent and, and to be aware that interpreting the interpretation of the environment, uh, um, of the digital environment and its uh, flux of information is uh, completely, uh, uh, um, is incompletely right. There is an incompletude of the information when we are attending media, when we are receiving media. And this is what we, 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 we I think we should, we, should, we should imagine as a form of repair, to be aware of our analphabetism in front, in front of this new alphabet. Thank you, uh, Kader. Um, perhaps this could also be um, a good moment to yeah, discuss uh, the program that um, to discuss further the program that uh, Francoise is organizing um, with La Colonie Nomade, if it is about relearning learning, right? If it is about relearning how to learn, um, then uh, it seems to me that indeed it is also very much about forms of sort of embodied congregation and forms of activity that include sort of a, a critique of reason, uh, right? But that do not limit this to academic uh, formats and frameworks. Um, so Francoise mentioned uh, a couple of tools, a number of tools, uh, blockades, blockages, uh, women's strike in the context of yeah, psychic exhaustion and bodily exhaustion as something that is unequally distributed, right? So uh, Akhil mentioned um, reason was deemed to be unevenly, unequally distributed uh, by uh, uh, sort of Western modern thinkers. But of course, indeed, uh, exhaustion is certainly uh, unequally and unevenly uh, distributed, to put it mildly. So my question also to Francoise would be, how can this be actually, um, how can this be turned into something that uh, can 
uh, help this uh, process? How can we prevent exhaustion, psychic exhaustion from becoming indeed a war of all against all, as you also put it, right? How can it actually uh, be used, be instrumentalized to create alliances, to create um, sort of collaborative forms of relearning learning rather than people sort of retreating into their um, um, own, uh, let's say, um, um, yeah, rather than particularly also uh, white uh, Western people withdrawing into forms of fascism or neo-fascism, for instance, right? So how can this become enabling and emancipatory, this awareness of exhaustion and its uh, unequal distribution? <clears throat> Being aware of it will not necessarily lead you to resistance, uh, as I say, uh, and I think uh, this is also what uh, um, the other were talking about. I, I do think we have to think when we were talking about uh, the that there are things that are irreparable. Uh, I do, for me, uh, what's going on is also destroying a human being, not only physically, but. Uh, um, really mentally, there is more and more uh, destruction uh, of uh, the psyche. Okay, so the awareness, I don't think the question of awareness will necessarily change. It's, it's not because you have the consciousness of something that you, that you necessarily resist. But I will say that you have a lot of resistance today. There are a lot of uh, different resistance. It does not stop. I mean, even in France, uh, you, you do have... Uh, uh, young people getting together in the uh, art school, they are, you know, building collectives, uh, uh, association, you know, working with migrants and refugees. Um, but so it, it's, it, that's possible, the idea. But the, the point is, like, uh, we are tired. We are made tired. It's tiring. We are tired. We are really tired. And there is a fatigue that uh, I do think that we have to acknowledge. And um, there is perhaps the right to rest that we should also include in the uh, practice of repair, that we need to rest some time and to, yeah, to, to because uh, I, don't, I don't think we can sustain the incredible um, machine. Uh, because when I say exhausted, I'm thinking, you know, I mean, uh, in solidarity with women who clean hotel in Paris. They are, they are saying, they are exhausted every day. They do two hours transportation, they do 50 rooms, uh, but they, they pop up pills against, against pains because they have their knees. Their thighs. It's very concrete. It's not an idea. It's very concrete. It's in the body. And they go home, they have children, and now there is no school. And this, there is very little thing that can be done except to be together except to go out of isolation. The first thing to fight against exhaustion is to be together. It's, uh, it's really uh, against um, rebuilt relation. And then after, when you are together, you can imagine what you want to do or what you are more able to do because not everyone can do the same thing. And one will start a school, another a blog, another a book, whatever. And um, so it's, it's more that I do think, uh, as I was saying, that there is a growing gap between uh, technological discovery, and they may go to what Ashley was saying, you may be related to that, in technology, medi uh, medicine, and science, that pretend to be neutral and for all mankind. And in the meantime, the incredible devastation that is going on. And they are, I mean, la, under our eyes here in Pantin, we don't need to go further, you know, further than where we are here in Paris now, in that neighborhood in which we are. Um, so there are moments, um, um, I don't want to fall into some kind of idealistic things where we'll get together and, uh, but I, I do think that when I say get mad, fight back, is like to, to um, that uh, that anger is is a life force. There is a possibility with anger. So that's the first thing because 
uh, exhaustion is also about fear. You are afraid, you are tired, and you are afraid because there is something in the energy of the body that go down. So it's... Uh, it's um, but um, I don't see how neoliberalism and heteropatriarchy will allow for... Um, will stop that. I, I, they need it. They, otherwise, they will not survive. So... Uh, but... I'm, uh, I don't know to, to speak in, in <laughs> I, I'm just, uh, yes, I mean, I just, okay, yesterday I went, I came home quite late after, after curfew. And the, in the subway, it was a majority of older black men, African. And I think they were going for, you know, the night, uh, um, they, they were night guards or, or they were very tired. So that was the two third of the public and a third were people who were not going well, shouting. Uh, I mean, they, 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 they needed, you know, some help and some care. And so that were the two public and it was uh, 8.30 and there were practically no women because women were at home taking care of children and because women it's mostly in the early morning that you see them because they go to clean places. And that was that. That was the economy exhaustion, like this short moment I was in the subway. Exhausted body going for the night shift and other form of exhausted body of people who were... Who, we are, you know, uh, wandering, shouting in the subway, and the contrast between the silence of this exhausted body and the shouting of this other form of exhaustion was quite, uh, was very much uh, what I'm talking about. Yes, sort of a resonance emerging between different forms of exhaustion. And indeed, my question would also be how to. Uh, how these uh, sort of processes um, can be encouraged and structured of um, exhaustions coming together, if you will. Um, thank you. But people yeah. do. People yes. do. They, mm -hmm. they come together. Mm -hmm. But my my point is like, how are we going to do um, uh, get together in so that we can at least uh, weaken that economy? Yes. Because people are doing, people are, what, people are fighting back, people are marching in the street, organizing, doing whatever, you know, so many, many, many things and all over the world, not only in France. The point is when we are going to have the tipping point with this incredible, incredible force uh, of murder uh, and death. And so this is what I think. I do think that at one point we will have to think of fighting back but when I say fighting back, not I, I don't I think they're going to be, um, yeah I, I don't see how these forces will um, will surrender uh, nicely. Yes. There are interests at at stake, and the interests are not economic, as as also I should say, they are also narcissistic. They are very deep, 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 deep interests, and. It's more than just economic interest. It's, not, it's more than just material interest. It's deeply about the pleasure of inflicting uh, pain. Yes. So the uh, indeed the uh, psychic element, uh, the libidinal or perhaps no longer fully libidinal element, um, was of course also a thread running through the proceedings. Um, perhaps before also open, opening it up to the audience, we could maybe also flesh out a little bit this um, potential dialogue, also actual dialogue between um, Kader um, uh, and uh, Catherine. Um, so Kader, in your introductory remarks, you uh, mentioned, I think, an Algerian psychoanalyst who um, um, noted that actually when French... Um, psychiatrists and psychoanalysts came to North Africa, they basically did not see the local population as being constituted by people who have sort of a full psychological life, right? They did not really 
qualify as true individuals with all these layers of the psyche, right? Not Algerian, ah. uh, Senegalese. Senegalese, his name, okay. Yes. Yeah, his name is Momar Gay. Yes. Professor Momar Gay. He, he, in 1972, actually, he opened for the first time, basically, in Africa. It was. It is an historical moment. Uh, the psychiatric, uh, I mean, the schizophrenic department of the Fan Hospital for Traditional mm -hmm. Healing. <coughs> uh, I think this is a very important moment because... Uh, I mean, I've been doing a lot of research on, on uh, through the review uh, that I highly invite you to read called Psychopa Psychopathology Africaine that has been run from 1967 until uh, 2002, I think. And Momar mm -hmm. Gay was the, um, the director of this uh, review with on, uh, René Collignon. And what, what I found extremely interesting uh, talking about what we've been talking today uh, also what Catherine uh, Malabou uh, referred when she was saying that uh, it was clearly admitted that uh, the trauma was sociopolitical and, uh, and there was another trauma, which is the organic trauma, and that today the borders are the, is very porous. I think what I've learned with, uh, with Romain Marguerite is that uh, this, uh, yeah, the complexity of the, the 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 way the 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 trauma uh, uh, has worked as a clash between a Western rational conception of the of the self and uh, what was here when when these white psychiatrists arrived is uh, for me it's, it, it, it's definitely an interesting conversation because I have met a lot of psychiatrists I mean in Cameroon in uh, in Mali in Algeria in Morocco in Malawi. Most of them who have been able to be educated both in the West and in Africa and working now in Africa, they found they have found an interesting way to heal mental illness, to, to actually care about mental health using both education, merging the Western uh, uh, conception of unconsciousness and, uh, and with all these trauma that we can Im imagine, like the sociopolitical trauma, and uh, the relation between the subject and the rest of the community, the, the, the one present and the world of the invisible. So, yes, I saw the question and it was, it, it, it is a Senegalese uh, uh, psychiatrist and uh, his name is Momar Gay. And this, of course, is very much also linked to um, Franz Fanon's diagnosis, right, mentioned by Catherine, that indeed perhaps psychoanalysis and the categories of Western psychoanalysis and psychiatry are not really applicable because there is no, no. Oedipus complex really and one needs to um, develop a different approach, a socio-genetic approach. Um, yes, I mean, uh, yes. I, I've, I've watched your fragments of a mental health and I found it very nice, very interesting. Very interesting. But, um, but um, you know, this diversity of approaches, just echo. echo. This diversity of approaches to the uh, mental uh, traumas um, is also reflected in something very Western, which is that in the history of uh, Western psychotherapy, there has been something like a colonization, an internal colonization, which is the colonization of the brain by the unconscious. And so the brain, and, and particularly the subconscious, has been, have been uh, totally um, excluded, rejected, treated as subalterns uh, by, uh, let's say, classical uh, and dominant psychotherapy. And when I read Fanon, I could not help but hearing also in his uh, uh, critique of psychoanalysis, I couldn't, couldn't help hearing the reaction of a body, you know, uh, like the, as if the brain was speaking through him, like something has been totally cut off uh, from, uh, from the Western body. And, and, and it, it's coming back today because... Uh, uh, when you said it is true that the socio-political trauma and the organic trauma are in fact one and the same, uh, they both, uh, this is a, a fact in neurology today, they both show 
on um, technical imaginary, imagery. I mean, the brain immediately bears traces of uh, the impact of the trauma. And this is something that has not been at all taken into account by psychoanalysts. For example, for Lacan to speak about the brain is a catastrophe. For him, it means, oh, this is uh, the biological, is terrible, etc. But I think this is a very, very uh, uh, serious problem. So for me, there's a kind of uh, echo, uh, I, I will just finish on that, a kind of mirroring between uh, coloniality, colonialism, and the way in which uh, there has been also a kind of psychological, psychotherapeutic colonization in, in, in the Western psyche, you know? Yeah. How do you um, sort of see the... Um let's say the neurobiological turn, the return to the brain, um, this kind of critique of the Freudian psyche as being disconnected from the brain, how do you see that in relation to, um, yeah, to the developments discussed by, uh, by Achille, right? There is also in many quarters a kind of reductivism underway, right? A kind of neurological or neurobiological yes. reductivism. Yes. Uh, absolutely, so when I speak about neurology, uh, there, would, there would also be a need for um, really distinguishing between a critical neurology, uh, which I tried to develop, and, and like dominant neurology that is, as you say, extremely uh, reductionist and uh, biologist in a certain sense. And so when, when I speak about neurology, it's of course a kind of enlightened neurology, uh, the one Sylvia Winter is talking about or other authors that... Uh, do not consider the brain as a deterministic organ, but on the contrary, as a plastic form that can evolve and sculpt itself uh, out of uh, education, influences, traumas as well. So you're right. Um, but any, I mean, psychotherapy is a war front, so you have always many, many tendencies fighting against each other. And of course, uh, neurology does not escape that. There's actually a mm -hmm. question a question to you, Catherine, in the chat. I will just read it out. Um, I wonder if Catherine Malabou could elaborate on the point. Uh, I have to sort of shield myself from this artificial sun here in the <laughs> auditorium. I wonder if Catherine Malabou could elaborate on the point about the trauma poetic uh, poesis nature of sociogenic trauma. Okay, it's derived from practices of the surreal but how does it manifest in those who suffer from brain trauma or post-colonial trauma? Is it symptomatic or is it part of therapeutic practices? Um, hmm, okay. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I would just answer briefly if I insisted in the end on the poetic um, nature of the subconscious trauma. It is because I would, not I would not want to reduce what Fanon says or, um, to something like a, pure, a purely uh, insistence on destruction, uh, uh, like victimization. Uh, I think that in sociogeny, you have also a desire for a poetization of the trauma itself. And for me, this is very important to have the two, to keep the two aspects of the trauma together. Um, because the inscription of the trauma is of course a destruction, is of course a loss, is of course, and it needs to be repaired. But at the same time, uh, it can be repaired, I think, not only through therapy, but also through this kind of poetic force that the trauma at the same time reveals. To Kader and Katrin, a question again in the chat. Do you allow in your work for a depathologization of the fragmented sense of self to take place? So the fragmented self, sense of self being depathologized. Is that something that you are pursuing <laughs> in your work? You want to answer, Kader? Wow. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, I already did a therapy, so I'm not going to start now to speak about, uh, no, no, you know, uh, my things, but uh, no, it, it's just, uh, uh, I think, uh, no, I'm, uh, 
I will answer to you via the voice of, of a friend, psychiatrist and psychoanalyst uh, who is in the film of um, uh, Interlacing Object. Um, Christine Theodore is her name. She works at Aubervilliers. And she, always, she once asked me about uh, coming to, in her workshop to speak about dreams. And uh, I have to say that, uh, and she was like uh, very interested and our colleague too, to understand whether an artist sometimes dream about the next piece, you know, the next work you want to do. And it, I, I found the question interesting because uh, it, we could expect that yes, but, but actually not. I mean, most of the time when you have dreamed about a work, a project, a piece, you do not do it. I mean, you found it amazing uh, uh, in your own self uh, pathological projection. But then when it comes to realm and, 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 and involving different criterions, it doesn't work. Thanks. Uh, should I answer as well? Yes. Then yes, if you don't want. Then... Yeah. yeah, I think this is, I like this question because I like this topography of fragmentation of the self. Um, and this is also a question for um, everyone here. Uh, what happens precisely when dreams cannot uh, take place? I, I, I think of some uh, lesion to the visual cortex that uh, make the patients incapable of dreaming because they, they can't see images. The brain, it, well, the visual cortex is impair, impaired and it creates a kind of fragmentation precisely of the self because uh, for many reasons the patient is not able to see himself or herself anymore in dreams, in reality, in the mirror. Uh, so, um, yes, I, I think that I'm trying to allow for this topography. Uh, what happens when uh, the self is totally uh, exploded in a sen certain sense uh, out of trauma? And I suppose it, 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 it might happen as well after uh, an attack or um, something uh, like a war wound or... So yes, I like this question. I think this is very important. There's the fragmentation of self. There's also a question, perhaps we can deal with it very quickly because there's more about um, um, Dubois' concept of double consciousness, which you uh, raised, so a kind of doubling. Uh, of the self, um, how would you translate the translation of double consciousness into our modern world? How to explain it in particular to the younger generation? This, I guess, also um, is a very much a question about yeah, the continuing relevance also of concepts from previous stages of our history of colonization and extraction and exhaustion. The contemporary, contemporary, yeah, uh, this was a question posed to you, but I guess it could also be addressed by others. Who... Uh, well, I think my, my colleagues uh, might answer much better that because uh, double consciousness is, a, um, is the key concept of William Du Bois in the, uh, uh, what is the English title? Um, L'âme du peuple noir, uh, black people's souls or something like that in which he explains that um, black people have a double consciousness. They have to have a double consciousness. That is the consciousness that identifies with the white dominant consciousness. And this is what Fanon explains also. And another consciousness, which is the consciousness of the dominated, the consciousness of, uh, of uh, their very self. <laughs> So, yeah, Achille, uh, do you want to? Uh... Yes, no, I mean, I, I love those things, uh, uh, Du Bois, uh, double consciousness. But I would really like to come back to a point uh, uh, Francoise was trying to uh, um, put forward. This, this idea of ex exhaustion. <laughs> and now, now, of course, Du Bois also talks about exhaustion. Uh, uh, he doesn't talk only about double consciousness. He also looks into this Fanon Du Bois. They are, they are all theorists of uh, exhaustion. Uh, um, and I'm wondering, Francois, whether what, what, what many call coloniality, uh, whether it's not really about that, that meaning uh, um, fatiguer les gens, 
fatiguer les corps, fatiguer les nerfs, euh, casser les reins des gens et euh, ronger leur cerveau et, et toutes les ressources oui. dont ils ont besoin pour, mm -hmm. euh, euh, pour s'auto-comprendre euh, oui. et, et pour habiter le monde. So I'm wondering oui, oui. about exhaustion, that what do you mean by, it's not, colonial is not about that. Now, if, yes, it, is it's, it's about that, that. if it is if it is about that, then I, I'm interested in the ways in which this business of traumatizing bodies, traumatizing um, nerves and, and, and everything, uh, traumatizing nature, um, The extent to which this business of traumatizing has not been outsourced to technology. Mm. Um, it was outsourced to reason played a key role in that project of traumatization and brutalization. It did. Nowadays, that terrible work is increasingly outsourced to technology technology itself being increasingly reduced to uh, reason being reduced to technique, the conflation of reason and technique in our times, mm -hmm. which is a time of technological escalation in the sense that we have never witnessed in the whole history of the humanity such quote unquote technological progress as today, most of which has basically um, intensified speed. That speed today is the key vector through which all that we knew before is undergoing a process of hyper acceleration, which produces then the people you see in the subway. I don't know at what time it was, but that was quite a riveting description you were giving us. Now, when we say techni, reason in the guise of techni, we mean two or three things. First, the, the fact that as a result of technological escalation, almost everything nowadays is reduced to a financial problem. Almost everything is a matter of financial value, which means of calculation. It also means reflexive thinking has been put out of the window in favor of what? In favor of uh, privilege, privilege given to data, the privilege given to data correlation that you are rational if you are able to correlate data, if you are able to use formal language, if you are able to make inferential deductions and all of that. That reason has been limited to that. It has nothing any longer to do with what Kader calls consciousness or what Catherine was suggesting a moment ago. It has nothing to do with that, we are told. It has all to do with uh, what, what, what... And third, the fact that sociality itself is increasingly automated. I mean, here we are. I wish we I could see you. I wish after this event, we could sit down face to face, have a drink and talk. But that's no longer the case. I mean, we are obliged to communicate as we speak now in an automated manner. That sociality itself is automated and that it, 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 It makes us feel um, fatigued in a certain manner. So uh, when you say then fighting back, that maybe it's time to fight back. And, and you say, okay, in fact, people are already fighting back. I find it interesting, but it seems to me we have to, to go a bit, let's say expand the, uh, the concept of fighting. I, I wonder, for instance, how in the double-edged conditions of, of, of our times, whether 
we can turn, for instance, uh, instruments of calculation into instruments of liberation. Whether, uh, I mean, what will it take to turn calculation itself into a political struggle, a site of political struggle, knowing full well that uh, more than ever before, modes of seeing and modes of measuring are key devices in the current projects of, of domination. How do we bring the fight at the very heart of those instruments of abstraction, which have, the, let's say, um, diminished the subversive power of reason and are trying to replace it with, uh, uh, let's say, a, a pure uh, manipulation of data. Those are the kinds of things, questions I think we have to keep in mind. And uh, of course, this still has some something to do with Du Bois' double, double consciousness. But, but, but maybe that double consciousness has been displaced and is being played out nowadays in sites and, and places we need to carefully identify. What, what are you thinking of, for instance? What kinds of places are you thinking of? Uh, I, I, would like to answer, I, would like, I, I would like to answer to Ashil. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay? go ahead, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Ach Ach Achille, euh, je suis tout à fait d'accord avec toi, je parlais un peu en français, tiens, ça a changé, um, que ça fatigue le corps. But I do think that even though there is speed today, there is still some body, bodies that are still exhausted. For instance, to answer to, you know, like a faster um, uh, things arriving at home by this big... Uh, site, internet site, I will not name them, you still have to body, and even they are more exhausted perhaps that on the factory floor, because we do know that even going to P is totally calculated. So how calculation is entering effectively the economy of exhaustion, and that you are right. There are still, in fact, uh, those who are still in the old, not perhaps of the ship, but of the, uh, you know, technic, uh, technological uh, place. Transforming the uh, uh, instrument, uh, uh, for instance, uh, with the lockdown in France, in, in no time, you saw dozen and dozen of young black uh, kid men on their back, rushing through the city to deliver food or books or whatever, people, you know, the, the bourgeois needed to, to spend a good lockdown. So... You, and they had all, you know, the thing to calculate and it's time and so on and, and all this. So there is in the, the calculation you are talking, the algorithm, we still, you know, uh, built on the exhaustion of body. Uh, it's absolutely striking in Paris, these people like rushing, the old young men rushing, black, mostly, majority, rushing through the city on their bike. Bike, some of them are being the bike that they rent from the city. So it's all also kind of a chain, economical chain. But you are right. I mean, the question of how to uh, go at the art and do the barrage to the blocking of the instrument of calculation and transform them on an instrument of liberation. There are some cases already of, uh, of people doing that, doing that to, to effectively also uh, turning the algorithm for that. So I, I do think that there is uh, something uh, possible there, but I, I, I do think that the two economies are there. Still the economy of mining, really mining bodies and, and soil and water and the deep sea, really like, like mine in 18th century or 19th century. You have that. And, but what you are right is that the, the, the management of that, the, the, the circulation, the extraction, production, consumption, circulation, navigation of that 
is much faster than before. But at the same time, it's also more fragile. What we see also, for instance, in uh, the ship has to be bigger and bigger and more and more container because they have to go fast. You don't need even, you know, people in the port to deliver that because everything is effectively computerized. But at the same time, you do see more and more um, container falling into the sea in the ocean because they are the, the because it's caused, I mean, the, the ship capsize, and this is caused by climate change, we put, you know, rougher weather. So there are effectively, what I mean by that is like, we still have to put different pieces of the puzzle together, and we do see slowness, speed, at the same time, algorithm, and still nonetheless the body that is exhausted, and we shall, you know, 50, what Ruth Wilson Gilmore called premature death, you know, the vulnerability to premature death, and all this is together, this untangled. So, um, striking, you know, fighting back at the art of this instrument of calculation to transform them and to work how to transform them in an instrument of liberation, absolutely, yes. And at the same time, to see that this world of automation and calculation still need body to exhaust, mine to dig, miners to go to pick up, you know, what is needed to feed the machine that calculate. So how do we rethink uh, this uh, different, uh, this, uh, this um, entangled form of computation to allow for effectively some good to go faster? Through the through the world, or even information going faster, and how this uh, this is going on. So this, uh, I, I will say, uh, um, but it, you do have uh, instrument of liberation already being done. Uh, there is, for instance, you can find in some on some site exactly. Uh, rather than uh, if, uh, having surveillance of uh, minorities, you will have surveillance of uh, bankers and what they are doing and the money they, they get, so how the algorithm is, is turned against. Um, so I, I will say this is that, and I will nonetheless, uh, um, I, I need to also bring in the question of gender uh, and who are, you know, that the bodies, um, because the world of calculation, as you say, uh, that you describe, is in, in a way gender neutral. I mean, it does not, it does not, it's not so gender in a way. What is gender is, is within perhaps effectively deliveries is mas mostly masculine. But within the trans the transport, the, the working in the in the big uh, storage place, it's not. And this goes back to what I say, but in the plantation, when it was in some time what could we could call gender neutral, that is men or women, black and slave men and women, could be mined, their life force, their energy could be mined to their death, equally, equally. So we have also to, to uh, um, be a little sophisticated, more sophisticated also to see how this is distributed uh, in terms of gender and group and minority, how then it's so how is this world of computation and calculation is being translated concretely on the body, but also on this uh, not uh, uh, intangible or, uh, or dematerialized because it's, we know that it's not dematerialized at all. It's even, you know, very polluting. And uh, so to, to make this cartography in more precise way. And uh, otherwise, I wanted to say about uh, Kader, you do remember, and Achille aussi, yes, you remember at the last Atelier de la Pensée at Dakar, there was a, a panel on psychiatry in Africa, and it was quite uh, very uh, tragic. The, the description was tragic. Uh, of, uh, of what was happening in, I mean, there was no longer psychiatric hospital. There's, a, I mean, the, the, what, what we are shown people in chain again, um, uh, or for instance, uh, Karim Malazali was saying that in Algeria is just, you know, like chemical camisole. So there is also something very concrete happening uh, that we should not um, 
dismiss. In, I mean, there is uh, uh, the, the fan school, the, the, the Alger school, uh, uh, the, the Nicole, the uh, Nicole Hospital in Tunis, where uh, uh, fan on work, all this has disappeared. But there is also something, an effort pour rendre l'autre fou. Not seulement pour fatiguer le corps, mais pour fatiguer la tête. To, uh, uh, sorry, it's always in French. Sven, can I answer? Yes, but we are really running out of time uh, because we are indeed here trying to think uh, reflexively and reparatively under impossible oh. conditions, mm -hmm. and we really only have a few minutes left there. Yeah, you're right. You're right yeah. because uh, uh, you're right, Sven. Because here we have yes, to exactly. You're in yes. Paris. We have to go yes. back. Unfortunately, a lot of people live okay. Okay. Unfortunately, um, yes, you should. Thank you. But, Thank yes. you for thinking. But Kader, um, yeah, we have a few I mean, questions also for Ashir, yeah. but please, if you... It's, yeah. it's very quick. It's, yes. I think, I think uh, 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 the point that brought by Ashil about calcula, calculation, you know, if, um, of course, it's this very interesting debate since uh, Schumpeter about how capitalism has been rationalized and then transforming the reason into a, into a calculation uh, 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 economy of extraction. But I have to tell you here to, to finish with this question of uh, the computational economy he was referring to, that an interesting recent symposium, I was uh, in Algiers, it was online, but I was in Algiers, about the way that um, if we think about data mining economy, I would say it's not only the calculation, but rather the, the question of traceability of all the interaction that each human subject has with the cloud. And it's very interesting to see that even regarding Africa, I'm talking about Algiers, for instance, uh, I discovered that uh, after a report made by a friend, a coders, that because the majority of Algerian uh, are using internet uh, basically for YouTube, Google, um, Facebook and so on, they are uh, feeding the, the machine with their own data without being aware of that. So you have an, inc after the, the, the extractions of uh, the economy of exhaustion that Francoise has developed, you have an economy of, uh, of data mining that is totally illegal because of course the, the, the whole tech system works within a, a state of fact and not a state of right. And I think for me, I mean, the question of, uh, of this extraction has really, uh, 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 we, we really need to get back into the, not the need to learn about how does it work, you know, because I was even discovering, and to give you an idea, my, my friend Ismail Shaib was, was trying to explain to all the Algerian people present in the symposium that, of course, today you don't care about your data, but there will be one day you will care about, and it will be too late. And that day, will be exactly what has happened in Egypt with when Sisi has been buying data of Egyptian activists to then after the Arab, Arab Spring, uh, 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 to, to of course arrest and, 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 and enhance this authoritarian repression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. unfortunately, our very old fashioned, uh, in a way, uh, um, sort of de-accelerated conversation has been going rather too well. So we unfortunately probably have to skip some really interesting questions also to Achille about um, the human no longer uh, being the privileged uh, location of, uh, of reason, though perhaps we partly address that. And um, yeah, if we, um, I want to uh, turn the instruments of calculation into instruments of liberation, then um, time is an important factor and we don't have enough of it today, clearly. Um, but we still made a start with a certain conversation that will also be continued here at BAC and in Paris and um, elsewhere. Maria, yeah. you want to Thank have the Thank you so very much, uh, Sven, for saying this. Uh, because, of course, uh, negotiating curfew in Paris, uh, we agreed with La Colonie Nomade that by 6 p.m. we'll close this conversation. And indeed, um, let's not see this as a closing moment, but as a starting moment, because the project is envisioned as a thinking, imagining and acting place uh, that we have just inaugurated with this remarkable day, so rich, um, uh, and I really look forward to continue. For all of you who have joined, joined us today, I really hope you will join us for this series of bi-weekly gatherings, and the next one is on Sunday, 2nd uh, uh, of May. 
which will be partially screening of uh, Kadras Atiyah's film Body's Legacy Part 2, The Postcolonial Body, and followed by a conversation between uh, abolitionist scholar and activist Ruth Wilson Gilmore and writer, critic and curator Oliver Marbeuf. For now, um, all I can add is really big thank you, Françoise, Catherine, Achille, Kader, uh, and everybody, thank you so very much. This has been a remarkable day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, guys.